Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we do a formal introduction, just a very formal introduction. Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, New York Gift of Technology School of Architecture and Design, MS in Architecture, Computational Technologies. I'm Pablo Lorenzo Hero. I'm the director of the program, but also the uh, studio uh, professor for uh, this uh, midterm review that is um, uh, that is uh, a studio uh, Arch 701B. That is the first computational design studio in the program uh, that uh, started this fall. We have uh, currently four students that were able to uh, come to New York to start our program. So we are very happy to have them. And because of that, we were able to uh, focus a little bit more in uh, specific areas of research in each of the, in relationship to each of the interests of the students. So we developed kind of like small uh, little thesis kind of uh, in preparation for uh, the next semester. Uh, the computational design studio is called Inform Realism. And the reason for the name is that we started uh, understanding design and computational design by retrieving real time uh, information by surveying uh, certain portions of the city and certain buildings, certain interiors in relationship to uh, some of the students' interests. So the studio departed by assuming that uh, survey is already an act of design and that by retrieving your own data, you are already activating a certain uh, way of understanding reality. So we first started the studio by capturing data, analyzing data, uh, criticizing the conditions that, that they, how that data was retrieved and uh, displacing the conditions of origination that those uh, data sets were actually retrieving. So in that sense, uh, we started by surveying, but also developing in parallel uh, web scraping and also API through uh, Python by uh, retrieving and developing uh, for each student their own data sets in relationship to the uh, 3D scans that they have been developing. Uh, in parallel to that, the computational thinking has many different stages and different uh, ways of understanding computational thinking and computational design in relationship to the histories of theories of the evolution of computation in general. So the students are exposed to a variety of uh, different technological paradigms and uh, they are taking, they, each of them, they take their projects in relationship to those paradigms and by uh, focusing in one type of technology. Once they are able to focus on that type of technology, they relate it to a certain beginning of understanding of artificial intelligence, and uh, that takes them progressively to uh, understanding automation, but also uh, automating the design process. We are right now in a midterm review, so it is a, an early stage in which they are starting to compile computational thinking, computational design in relationship to automation. And now slowly we're going to start uh, uh, working into machine learning and artificial intelligence more frontally. The, um, uh, in the beginning of the semester, they were already activating artificial intelligence through uh, point clouds and um, uh, creating displacements and distortions of the uh, big data that they acquired. And now we're working a little bit more discreetly and more, uh, if you want, hands-on and developing a, a more precise process in relationship to the type of displacements that they are developing. Uh, the studio's objective is to actually uh, develop a sort of video game application. And we are not sure if we're going to be able to arrive there, but that's the objective in which uh, the acquired reality and the acquired data sets and their distortions, they will play an interesting relationship between real space and virtual space, trying to uh, think about physical navigation, interactivity with physical, actual real objects, and then process them uh, to be able to create a parallel relationship with the uh, elements that they're surveying. So in that sense, the objective is to develop a project of an application that would be able to transform reality real time. So that's the ultimate objective. We're not sure if we're going to arrive there, but we're going to play 
uh, the uh, with the parameters that would allow us to think about that, those problems. Uh, so in that sense, each of the projects they develop a different type of program. Uh, in terms of architecture programs, some of them are working with a museum, some are working with a library project. Uh, there are different typologies of problems in relationship to the site conditions that they are analyzing. All right, so this is a, a very brief uh, explanation of what we're trying to do. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions uh, in relationship to the brief, otherwise we, we start uh, with the first project. Any questions so far? Was there reviewers? No. I, I have a yeah. quick question. Are 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 all the students prepped with some sort of um, template script where they know that they need to present not only what they're doing conceptually, how they're doing it, et cetera, et cetera, or is it a kind of a free for all? How are we how are, are trying? Doing? We we Got try it. that. The idea is to have a a kind of organized presentation, uh, but you know this is the second month we we starting to know each other. Uh, oh, they oh, come from, from very different backgrounds. And I think course. that that understanding is very different. My studios are very systematic and very prescriptive in a way. And I try to hold myself from not doing so much that, but uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So we'll see, we'll see what happens today. Yeah, but, I, uh, I, yeah, I guess I think I would say to the student, if you see someone doing a great job explaining their project, feel free to change your project to improve the communication and what you're trying to do. Uh, I think that would be my only advice, but thank yes. you. I, I actually uh, want, would like to briefly introduce the, the reviewers today to the students so that you get to know a little bit more about them. Uh, you all know already Sandra Manninger. Uh, Sandra is actually, but for those of you that uh, you don't know, Sandra is actually involved in the program. Uh, Sandra is teaching uh, the um, computational uh, design elective course. Uh, in which students are working with, uh, uh, so far with Maya, with some uh, Maya scripts and some Maya modeling. And uh, they're actually going to start working with the more advanced automation uh, towards the next phase of the semester. Uh, we also have Nelson Montas, who is also, so thank you, Sandra, for joining us. By the way, Sandra, uh, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, especially because of your uh, international recognition and your career. So we're very happy to have somebody uh, of your statue uh, joining our program. Uh, we also have uh, Nelson Montas. Nelson Montas is a PhD uh, uh, architecture professor. And actually now Nelson is um, developing a, a kind of alternative uh, way of understanding his own career. He's going into software development. Uh, we have the opportunity to collaborate with Nelson for many years. I know Nelson uh, from WIC uh, Barcelona has been collaborating with my office in some projects. So uh, I'm also very happy to have Nelson. Nelson is actually working on the uh, computational design workshop that is in parallel to the studio, uh, teaching and assisting us with uh, Python and Grasshopper, right? So thank you, Nelson, for, for being with us and thank you for all the all the work. Uh, by the way, in uh, the, the program is very particular because I also teach tutorials in other classes. So we have history theory, we have design, and it's a very interesting combination. And I feel a lot of the gaps uh, in between the different courses in between with different tutorials and different computational technologies and related to history and theory. So uh, I also teach another class that is history theory of computation in which we alternate uh, history theory with computational tutorials. Uh, we also have uh, from internal from, actually everybody's internal to NYIT, uh, except for Gustavo. Um, so I'll introduce Gustavo uh, Rincon, Alfonso Rincon. Gustavo, we know uh, of his work. Uh, he's doing an amazing work at uh, Digital Futures. Uh, we had the opportunity to exchange uh, actually conversations and presentations with Tom Berberes in different opportunities. And uh, Gustavo is actually an expert in media uh, technology. So uh, I, I especially thought about inviting you here because uh, this is a kind of media specific type of project. So uh, thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, we also have uh, Marcella del Signore. Marcella is um, a director of the MS in Urban Design at NYIT and is also uh, listed as a faculty in our program, although we, Marcella is very busy, so we couldn't 
uh, we couldn't uh, capture Marcella to be able to teach some of our courses yet. But we, hopefully, we we'll we see have, what we'll happens. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are also busy in NYIT that is very difficult to dedicate time to other things. So, but Marcella, you know, we try to invite you as many reviews as possible, and to have you. You're always in the lecture uh, discussion. So. Uh, I appreciate your collegiality and uh, the support to our program and to all the public events that you do at the school and also your expertise. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, actually the students, I told them that to feel free to contact you uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for other things, you know, like for even for, because you have a lot of experience in uh, digital, uh, in computational design, in fabrication and also in robotic interactivity. So which are some of the things that we discuss in our program. So. I look forward to interacting now yeah. in the future. Exactly. Thank you so much. And Thanks. finally, Tom Berberes, that who uh, we usually uh, are able to kidnap from other things and have him as much time as possible in our reviews. Uh, Tom Berberes, I, I, well, you know him already, but uh, for, uh, well, everybody knows Tom. So Tom is an international figure, uh, has been involved in the Architectural Association in early stages. I always uh, I'm happy to say that Tom and Patrick Schumacher, in a way, were the one of the influences for Saha Hadith's uh, projects through the DRL program. So uh, Tom has a, a ton of experience in the relationship and the evolution of computational design and uh, fabrication, uh, uh, especially at the AA. Then Tom worked in Asia for many years uh, at the Hong Kong University and now is with us at NYIT. So, we're very happy to have uh, somebody with your international career with us. So thank you, Tom, for joining us. Thank you, Pablo. Your, your words are too kind, I have to say. I have to live up to your words. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm not exaggerating because everybody knows the internal stories, right? Uh, Patrick uh, uh, at the DRL, right? And you, you had a great team. And then I had uh, some friends that were teaching with you. So I know a, a lot of internal discussions. And I know that a lot of the, the students that were working at the DRL end up working at Saha. So uh, that's a fact, in a way. So I'm not uh, ex exaggerating. Tom, we, we need a book. Exactly. We need, we need to know the inner We need workings. a book of that. Yes, exactly, of, of, of that, yeah. That's, that's a good idea. I'll leave it to those that have followed that trajectory now. <laughs> you know, at Cooper, Cooper Union, you know, the AA, you know, there the, are the different times and histories of peoples and connections that need to be uh, documented, in a way. Mm -hmm. so, Anyway, so thank you, thank you so much, everybody. So we have four students. We have uh, Salma Katas uh, from Morocco, and uh, Salma uh, is going to start. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something briefly about yourself, uh, how you uh, came to NYIT, or we can directly just you know to make a little bit of a social uh, time so that people understand your background and where you come from. But Salma is a Fulbright uh, scholar student, uh, and um, well, you know, I'll let you, Sandra, uh, Salma, sorry, introduce your project and uh, guide us uh, through what you're doing. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Salma Katas. Um, I'm an architect from Morocco, uh, and I came uh, to do NYIT because I'm interested in the in architecture and uh, the computational technologies and how we can implement these technologies in the design process and the fabrication. Um, so I will start by sharing my screen. I just pasted in the chat, the middle board. I forgot to send it by email, but uh, you can access the drawings. The only problem is that the scale of the middle board is gigantic. So it's difficult to find the drawings, uh, but we're working on it. But you can navigate through the projects also in parallel to the presentation of the student. Now you can, you want to share? Yeah, perfect. Salma, uh, can you, are you talking or? Yeah, well, you have to be a little bit patient, right? With your internet. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see the screen. But, uh, no, now we can hear you and see the screen. Yeah, perfect. 
So hello everyone, uh, I'm going to present to my project, which is called the Museum of Babel, uh, an infinite museum space. So the first work that was done is a 3D scanning and the big data processing of the Guggenheim Museum, as I'm interested in the typology of the building and the concepts of the spiral that creates a spatial continuity inside of the museum, and in a way tries to create an infinite space. The second building that I was uh, working on is also the Met Museum, which is also uh, a space that creates the same spatial experience, but in a different way, uh, through the maze, through the question of the frame the, and the transcendence of art and space. So through the 3D scanning, um, I was able to um, uh, to create a point cloud of both museums. I think we have to be, yeah, ah, okay, disappear. Yeah, it is Excuse me. So after that, um, uh, if you want to play again, the Guggenheim did not show. We saw a little bit of the Met, but not the Guggenheim. So this is the point cloud model uh, based on the 3D scanning of the building. Uh, the point cloud is represented to reflect the different aspects of the space inside of the building uh, by representing the experience of the spiral as a way to achieve a spatial continuity and infinity. Uh, as we see here, the, the vanishing point of the building is the dome uh, as we go up the spiral. Uh, the point cloud representation uh, also helps represent the building as it was never seen before. Uh, because of the point as an index. So we have these different representations of this, the building where we see both spirals that are uh, constructing the space of the Guggenheim. The point cloud also represents the subject and object relationship as it reflects the experience inside both buildings, how uh, the Guggenheim is a deep space. It's an entire space that is continuous, while uh, the, the Met is a picture plane kind of space, a layered space that is uh, discovered while we navigate it. So in this representation, I also show the possibilities of representing the building uh, in the point cloud with the point as an index through the application of uh, vectoral forces uh, uh, on uh, each point. Um, this representation uh, is also special as it allows us to have this transparency of the space, how we can see the inside and the outside and see the relationship between the different uh, spaces through the point cloud. Uh, in some drawings, I also try to reflect the realism of the space and the experience of taking the ramp um, because the ramp is a continuous space where we are moving uh, in one uh, direction, but we are moving also up the building. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this experience is also uh, gives the impression that the, the spiral is continuous and it's not, it's never ending. This uh, experience of infinity is also felt inside of the Met through the repetition of spaces uh, and the movements from one building to the other through the thresholds and spatial 
um, uh, movements where the arts becomes the space and creates the aspects of infinity. There is also the question of the frame inside of the Met and how the painting transcends the space of the, of, uh, the painting. Uh, in this example of the lobby, uh, where we see a framed space that looks like a painting, but it's actually a space. And inside of it, there is another frame until we get to the real painting. In other spaces, the painting becomes the space and I couldn't not notice the uh, resemblance of these uh, relationships between the painting of the space in Panini's work, uh, uh, which is uh, called uh, Ancient Rome. Uh, in this space, uh, we can see how the Met, the idea of the Met is reflected as a single building that is constructed by multiple buildings and art pieces from different parts of the world, which leads to the idea of the city of Babel. This transcendence of space and art is also seen in the Guggenheim because the Guggenheim is, uh, has been um, criticized by the fact that it's, it sees why people visit the, the museum and not the paintings. And so in a, in a way, it's also art made as uh, a building. And uh, I try to represent that here as the, the Guggenheim as one of Kandinsky's paintings coming into life by Frank, Frank Lord Wright. So after all these representations of the point cloud, um, uh, some distortions were applied on it to see it from a different perspective. Here, the outer spiral is inverted inside. The shape of the building is changing. There is also this uh, extrusion of the spiral going up as the spiral never ends. And applying uh, multiple forces on the point cloud so that uh, create not only one spiral, but multiple spirals inside of the Guggenheim. Same thing was applied on uh, the Met, how to uh, turn the Met into this spiral form, this space that has a spiral form. Uh, in this drawing, the met space is turned into one continuous deep space. And so all the distortion of both buildings, combining the spiral form, the infinite aspects of the Guggenheim and the realism of the met as a different buildings, uh, connected all together, multiple arts from all around the world and transcendence from outer space led, uh, leads to the reflection about a new space typology of the Museum of Bubble, a third space that is combining both museums. It is the Guggenheim, it is the Met, but it's also neither these spaces and it's both spaces all combined. So this leads to uh, the project of the Museum of Bubble, which is a virtual space navigated inside of the Guggenheim. Uh, that is combining both the, in, the spatial infinity of the spiral and the, the question of the met, the frame, and the transcendence between art and space. So the reading that I chose for the projects are the books of uh, Borges, which are the Book of Sand, the Library of Babel, and the Garden of Forking Paths, where uh, the author uh, represents the concept of infinity differently. In the Library of Babel, the library is an infinite space that is constructed by an infinite galleries with books that are the combinations of all possible combinations of letters and characters. Uh, another infinity is the Book of Sand, which is an infinite book that has no beginning and no ends. And we can see throughout the readings that the author kind of foreshadows how the Library of Babel could be reduced to one book. 
which is the infinite book. And the book also can be represented as a library and vice versa. So for the museum, um, the, the Museum uh, of Babel is a museum of infinite galleries that exists at the same place, but at different times, where two people can be in the same space, but visualizing different galleries, uh, making it an infinite, uh, uh, an individual experience that changes from one person to the other. And it changes also from one visit to the other. And it's also a space where the paintings uh, can become, uh, one painting can become all paintings, uh, same way as the Library of Babel can be reduced to the Book of Sand or the space itself becomes the painting. So in order to achieve this uh, infinite aspect of the Museum of Babel, the space is constructed by uh, three layers, which are the itineraries inside of the space, the Guggenheim space, the polymorphic spaces, and the painting collections. So before talking about the layers, I wanted to uh, dive into uh, the, the idea of the spiral how it was um, thought of by the architects, the history of this concept and how it changes, it changed uh, during the design process. Uh, so the idea of the spiral always existed in the architect's uh, sketches or plans. Even in his early drawings, there is also this mention of a constant ramp. One of the first buildings that uh, were sketches um, had the shape of a ziggurat uh, the ar architect also referred, referred to the building as a ziggurat. Um, there was also this resemblance between the first uh, sketches and an early building that was designed by the architects in the 1920s, uh, which is the Gord Gold Gordon Strong Automobile Objective. This building was formed by a double Fermat spiral, uh, which is a continuous space that takes the person all the way up and then down by while moving in the same direction. So uh, after that, in, in, uh, in other sketches, uh, the building was inverted and even the name of the building was inverted by the architect uh, th that he called Taru Giz, which is uh, the a ziggurat inverted. There was also this idea of a quick ramp uh, that is a shortcut, shortcut between the different levels uh, of, the, of the building in, instead of the stairs. Uh, but it was not built because of technical issues. Um, but the trace of the idea was kept in the final plan. Uh, that's it's that form of the bump up that we see in each um, uh, in each floor. There was also other drawings where we don't have only one quick ramps but multiple quick ramps uh, that takes the visitor into different spaces. So this idea of shortcut shortcut of having a quick ramp but also having this continuous space. And during one of the presentations in the 1950s, the architect envisioned that the building was going to be experienced uh, from top down by taking the glass elevator. But over the time, curators now in the museum started programming the museum from the bottom up, uh, following because in the in the collections we follow the evolution of the artist. So the idea is to move uh, up to a larger spaces while we are experiencing the museum. Uh, but there is also like this intention of programming the museum to be experienced both ways. In one of the drawings, I also um, uh, wanted to explore this concept of infinite growth because the concept of the spiral form of an infinite museum space was also uh, expressed by, the, by Le Corbusier um, in his uh, Museum of Unlimited Growth. Uh, so here the Guggenheim is reimagined as an algorithmic spiral growth around circulation that allows to expand the space with time. So we start with the first spiral, but it keeps uh, it keeps expanding uh, to the infinite. So for the Museum of Babel, um, the idea is to achieve this idea of eternal growth, uh, having multiple spirals, multiple itineraries, uh, and a space that is not only experienced from the top down or bottom up, but uh, uh, a spiral that is experienced in very different ways that hasn't that doesn't necessarily has a beginning or an end. So now for the three layers that I talked about that construct the infinite uh, aspect of the building, um, the first one is the path, the itineraries, and the threshold, threshold, the thresholds. 
Um, so the Museum of Babel includes two spirals, a quick one, uh, which is the stairs that, that are also included in the navigation and the main ramp with eight different points that are represented as thresholds distributed in the space. Uh, some of them connecting the, the main spiral to uh, the secondary spiral. And the multiple uh, permutations between them creating the itineraries of the building. So one itinerary is defined by the visiting uh, of all uh, uh, the points in all possible orders. So one possibility is going from point zero to one, then one to two, two to three, three to four, uh, until eight, and then going back from eight to zero. So when we go back from eight to zero, it's different as it's a one continuous space where other points don't exist. There is only point one and point eight. So there are multiple possibilities. In this one, we have uh, the example of going from five to four, then four to two, where three does not exist in this path uh, until later on. The space of the point three, three is included in the itinerary but is not reached until later on during the navigation of the space. And each time the next path is uh, activated uh, or is constructed when the person reaches the threshold point. So these points are called thresholds because um, they let they allow us to move from one path to the other, activating the following path. Uh, it resembles the, the mid spaces because it's also uh, a connection between different buildings and the thre thresholds are connection between different buildings. So these points are also connection between different paths. So when you go from six to two, uh, from two to six, it activates the second path, which is six to three where only six and three exist and other threshold does not exist, don't exist. Uh, so in the Museum of Babel, these points can also have special moments where the space becomes the, the, the painting, then it activates the following path to another threshold. So these are all uh, some examples of how the, the itineraries are built uh, inside the, the museum. And we also go back to our starting points. So the ramp doesn't have a beginning or an end. Each point can be the beginning and there are around 300,000 possible itineraries between the eight thresholds. So this is the first layer. The second layer of the space is the polymorphic shapes of the ramp. Uh, the ramp becomes a, mor a morphing geometry uh, using math equations with parameters that are linked to the different itiner itineraries that we talked about. And each path between the two thresholds activates one variation of the space, a space that keeps shifting while it's navigated. So these are the multiple variations of the form of the spiral. So the third layer of, uh, of the Museum of Babel is the paintings. Uh, I created a data set of Met collection. So through Google API uh, and uh, web scraping, I created the data set of Met collection using API to create multiple collections based on the popularity of the buildings, for example, uh, that is based on the search volume on the internet, based on uh, social media uh, posts, uh, but also other collections that are based on uh, either the, uh, the artist, the period, but also uh, whether the 
painting is archived or not. Uh, this, uh, this is important because most collections in the Met are archived. And so it's a, a huge amount of, of, uh, of uh, paintings that are not displayed. And so uh, that can be uh, brought back to life in the Museum of Babel. So we have this layer of hyperlinks of paintings that keep changing while the space and the paths are changing as well. And one hyperlink can be one painting, but also include other paintings. So these hyperlinks in themselves become the museum because the museum's uh, museum is inside each one of them, uh, same way where the library of Babel becomes the book of sand. So we have this infinite ways of ways of uh, painting displays that are also layered in the nagification of the space of the Museum of Babel. So the infinity of the Museum of Babel is constructed through the layers of three infinites and the multiple combinations of these infinites. We have the, the threshold A, for example, that generates the path to AB. Uh, this path, uh, can generate one of the paths that are all existing in the same place. Uh, they represent, in a way, a par parallel realities of, of one space, but at different times. Um, then this activates uh, one spatial variation. And on top of that, we have the collection of arts uh, that is uh, uh, displayed inside of the museum. So this is an animation that shows uh, just the morphing of different um, uh, variations of the space when we reach one threshold. Can you blow that one up? Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Salma. So now we we can start the discussion. I can start because I have to go at 11 and then come back. OK, great. So thank you, Salma, for your presentation. I think it was very clear. And, and I think it was, uh, um, I think there is, you know, very good solid ground, I think, for the next step. So. Um, I will start saying that I think to me, the, the, the one narrative that starts to emerge from your project is really the relationship between subject and object. And I think this is what you started working with uh, first uh, looking at the Guggenheim and then begin to understand this type of uh, relationship also with the math that perhaps in the math are not so apparent, but you begin to discover how again subject and object is, uh, is uh, intrinsically connected, but at the same time, how to give you different type of parameters to begin to index space. Uh, I think through that, uh, there are two, two things that I think you start to embed within the project and engage. Um, I think with this, this narrative of understanding the, sub, the relationship between subject and object, uh, you start to apply different type of operations that relate to inversion. To me, there is also a notion of overlay of spaces that is pretty strong, and I'm going to get to this point, I think, towards the end when you start to, again, work with the museum specifically, but also scaling the repetition. Uh, so I think these three operations start to merge, especially when you, when you begin to work within the, the, the scale, let's say, of the museum itself and allows you to give you some operative parameters to understand how the three scales, and let's say the three scales of the project, which is the path, the thresholds and the painting can start to be configured. Uh, and I think this, this blurring between uh, and the, the exchange, I think in some points that we see through the animation, through the drawings, et cetera, et cetera, between subject and object operates right now, both at the spatial level. And I think at the spatial level is quite clear but also the experiential level. And this is really the, the one point of the starting point to me, perhaps, which is the next step within the project. Um, because I think the experiential level, it's, it, it's really start to drive the, the, the way in which uh, uh, the project, again, is not only informed by the categories of spaces, but also the navigation. And the navigation is the way in which I think when we see at the end, 
the way in which you can come back to the starting point. Uh, so the if we you know looking at the, the the way in which the sparrows start to operate, I think this the, the thresholds to me uh, are quite important portals. Let's say to go back to uh, the spiral condition, which is the armature, and access the third component, which is the subject or perhaps the object, which is the art component, the art pieces. Um, and so I think your project really start to set up the narrative for. Uh, the inversion and the inversion that again is not only the inversion of space but the inversion of content and uh, so that you go from the from the from the art the way in which the art is displayed and this represent portals into accessing again the space or vice versa from the space to the art uh, and i think i'm wondering you know how these start to inform uh, the next step, which is the embodiment of this to, uh, to, to create a dialogue between uh, uh, the reality that is created here and the reality that exists. Uh, and, and this to me is the question of how this, uh, this, uh, the, these portals that right now you set up through the project to access different multiple realities, which right now it's about the path, the threshold and the art pieces can actually then connect to um, to the next level of understanding how the mechanism, if you guys are going to develop the game, can be activated through, uh, through that. So how the scaffolding of the game, let's say, start to respond to, to, the, to, the, to the way in which the, uh, the, um, the, the, the space somehow is set up right now. Uh, so I think this, this notion of growth and infinite space, it, it's exactly to me what's happening within the threshold levels, even if they're really plug in within the large spiral component. And, uh, and, also, uh, and also the illusion somehow is given really by not the space itself, but, but the navigation through the space. So the experiential component is quite strong. Um, then I have a question for you. When uh, in the next step, when you begin to, at the end, right, you begin to morphing the ramps, that's to me, it's after the catalog and indexing of understanding the three parameters and the three special components of the project, which is spiral, the threshold and the, the pieces, when you begin to morph the ramp, what are the type of navigation condition and blurring the boundary between subject and object you begin to portray? And so that's another level of distortion. Uh, so that to me, it's a, it's a potential for the project and uh, that it starts to be investigated towards the end is really the last step that you guys, you in your project, you got to. And, uh, I, and I think this could be really a, a a strong strategy is to understand, number one, I think this fractal condition of moving back and forth from macro to micro, but also how this movement, and this I refer to this as a, as, as a navigation, you refer to this term many times in your project, really start to embody this illusion of space through the, through the specific strategies of distortion. Um, and uh, uh, so to me in the end, it's like, it, that's the premise of the studio, how you access parallel realities, because that's what you're gonna be asked to my understanding right at the end to perhaps the construction of this game or video game or 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 mechanism that is able to inform the real the real reality and the the constructed reality and uh, uh and so th this i think it's uh, uh, it's a potential and uh, uh and uh, and i think you have a lot of parameters to move forward uh really touching on uh, again th th this categorization of components that right now are, are embedded within uh, within all levels of the project all the way to the to the strategies for distortion I can jump in here uh, I have uh, just to just to segue maybe some of Marcella's comments in a, in a moment or two I, I think your work is very very deep. Uh, intellectually as well as spatially, uh, you're dealing with. Um, I think a, a, you know, a, other than the the definition of infinite space, I think there's a certain understandings of of of, of um, a fuzzy and indefinite kind of qualities of space, um, and there's endlessness within the vortex. And I think I've always been fascinated by the vortex and a way that it's one of these forces that does not bring you from A to B. Um, and and it, it exists in our world in a, on a planetary scale. We spin around on planet Earth. 
whether or not that's relevant, of course, that creates our days and nights, um, whether or not it's relevant that at a uh, even smaller than microscopic scale, you know, protons and neutrons do the same thing. Um, but I think that architecture that does this has this particular kind of quality and very different in terms of both movement, but also visuality and experience. Uh, and it's great that, you know, starting with the, um, the Guggenheim, uh, I think there are other projects that just, you know, in terms of maybe the core building or that wasn't built, uh, UN Studios, um, uh, Mercedes-Benz Museum, which is a more complex, maybe not vortex, but a trefoil diagram, which returns and repeats. And it's something that you're starting to do with the deformations of surface that you have on screen on the right. Um, I'm not so clear on how the Met, it seems secondary, this, this frame and kind of carcass, um, which is very paradoxical and, and uh, even contradictory to the endlessness and the continuous flow of a vortex. Um, and maybe that's a useful way to contain uh, the, the infinity, if there's, if there's a bit of a contradiction in that. Um, not to say that you shouldn't pursue those, those contradictions or complexities. It's, it seemed like as you're going through your processes before you get to these deformations, um, you're focusing on the ramp uh, as it is in the Guggenheim. Uh, and then there are other vortices attached to that systemically like balustrades, the curatorial walls, the envelope. And I think one of the, one of the features of the project that's beginning to emerge is the subversion of these sorts of um, tectonic systems as separate uh, and in this sense, maybe it's more dealing with the endlessness that uh, Kiesler, Frederick Kiesler was, was um, proposing through his endless house um, and, and very much the digital project of the, the last quarter century or so of the, of the subversion of these tectonics into dis discrete and distinct elements, you know, ceilings, walls, floors, etc. This is really not necessarily anything new um, of what I'm saying. Not necessarily what you were saying. The, the diagrams are precise, but still there's a linearity of A, B, B, C, C to D, etc. And I think there's a great potential for the multiplicities of trajectories to create intersections and involutions and all kinds of new um, curatorial possibilities, but also new experiences of the building, the space, uh, and art. Um, maybe jumping ahead to the video game. And I don't know if there's, there's like a threshold where you're, I think you're already working within the virtuality of a video game. You know, to call it now we're gonna create um, a video game. I think it's the interfaces that maybe shift towards um, the potential of the user or the interface to be able to have some degree of intelligence in the model space to reconfigure or find new trajectories. So I think there are, there are a few possibilities of virtuality of uh, how you experience the realities of the plural of, um, of this um, project. One which would be um, to focus on, on motion and movement that isn't so much grounded. Uh, and that's what's kind of weird about, you know, putting on goggles, you know, they make us nauseous or some people um, because of it's a sense of ungroundedness uh, and of motion that makes us feel physically, or some people, uncomfortable, like the way a roller coaster might do, um, because it's motion that isn't something that we're accustomed to as walking or cycling or in a car, et cetera. Um, it sort of shocks, I guess, the cognition and our, uh, whatever's going on in the inside. Um, and I think that, that that potential of being able to move in an ungrounded way through other kinds of spirals or trajectories uh, has great potential through another kind of rituality. Uh, another is the, is the beginning of this physical deformation of spaces and seeing the potential of that within a virtual world of how those tectonics have the potential to be activated in real time and how the user of this interface, you right now, but potentially others, could activate um, and animate those surfaces. Uh, and that could be really quite spectacular where you'd want to go from A to F 
and from F to B, and how does that happen? Uh, how do you short circuit these sorts of tectonics to be able to create new kinds of spirals within that um, assemblage? The third might be uh, how uh, the selection of art, and it's so interesting looking at these um, scans of art in this black space that you have um, that are not the art pieces. It's the simulation of those art pieces. In that sense, maybe there are two ways of thinking of, and this is where the subject and object, uh, I, I think has great potential in, in your work, is not seeing the, the art as, oh, it's something precious in the space. These are scans um, and they can, uh, on, on one possibility, they can be distributed as point clouds, uh, another, and, and activated in within the spirals and in some ways of getting closer, further. Um, and that's, that's potentially a transformation of the art. Another is to enter the space of the art itself, the scenes, the landscapes, the compositions of, of art. This is maybe more possible within, uh, well, representational or abstract art as well. A third, which is taking the, the Right now in the Guggenheim, or even in the Met, the wall is the activation surface for art. You hang stuff on it. The big pieces in three dimensions sit in the middle of rooms as sculpture or, or other sorts of artifacts, physical artifacts. Um, but I think you could map this onto the surfaces in ways that they're not separate. They're actually part of that activate, activated surface. Um, and that could be turned on and off and, um, the, the question of motion through um, through a museum, you know, the, the, the amount of uh, traffic that one has to go through, that the distance can be collapsed in ways that you could you could put the entire collection of the Met into a smaller experience, uh, and um, the, the the physical motion from one piece to the next becomes a different sort of question of time. Um, I know that that that's probably sounds a little bit abstract, but I think there's some really wonderful possibilities of virtuality that don't really need this defined threshold. Here we are in this non-virtual world, which I think you already are in this interface and ways of experiencing uh, spatial articulation, tectonics, uh, and the art in a sense, but to integrate those um, uh, uh, the tectonics and the the, the the physicality, so so to speak, of the space that you're within, and not to separate that necessarily from uh, art as um, object. Thank you, Tom. I just want to make a couple of clarifications because you are hitting on the points that we have been discussing. So the actually Salma uh, has been looking at the one of the reasons why uh, she chose the the Guggenheim. And as an analysis is the Le Corbu, right? As a kind of dialect. And you know that they were competing uh, for the kind of price of the infinite museum. Uh, so Salma did an analysis of that. And also obviously the Mercedes Benz. Uh, the, the only question to me is that when there are multiple references to me, we miss the opportunity to look at the latencies in actual projects. And one of the points of the 3D scan uh, is actually to look at the at the latency of the spaces that we are analyzing. And of course, uh, Borges comes back, Le Corbu somehow is a kind of ghost there, and the Mercedes-Benz, which is one my favorite building by uh, UN Studio, uh, it comes back one way or another, right? Uh, but uh, in relationship to what you're saying uh, about the experience of the art, not as an object, uh, Salma is actually thinking about that, and because that's why in the Met, the painting at the end of the corridor Right, that gives Salma the opportunity to think of the painting as a landscape and the painting as breaking the frame and the painting getting away from the stage of representation and start becoming part of the actual activation of the experience. So that uh, is something that we're thinking about. And the the other comment on the on why the Met, I think the Met is kind of the the key in New York as a whole because it's the real representation of New York City. Is multiple buildings within the city. It's a city in itself. I, at least for me, uh, in winter, I spend every weekend in the Met uh, all day long, right? It's like uh, having uh, the, the most nice 
ways of experience the city in a kind of a city environment. But uh, the problem of the, um, of the Met relative to the Guggenheim is a, is a very interesting dialect and a contradiction. You call it a contradiction, but I think that that's what we're interested in because the- I call it a contradiction provocatively. I, I think yes. it has, you know, it's architecture is about stasis, heaviness, you know, in some ways about finite space and, and a curation of views and, and infinity points. And so, you know, the, the classicism of the Met is, um, is potentially a productive yeah. contradiction. I, I don't see, I see that as, as uh, it's, uh, it complexifies the, uh, the potential of the, the, the Guggenheim. And I, well, I don't see that as- Yeah, that, that's why, you know- spring but... potential. Yeah. But that's what it does, the Babel thing, the Tower of Babel, right? Because it's like literally, and I think that the new, the new curator of the Met is aware of the kind of pastiche of different things that, and is making into a very interesting construction because what Salma is trying to do is to bring that back to the spiral infinite, right? So you have all the past, I think that, uh, in that sense, I read your contradiction productively in that sense. I, and I think that, it also goes back to the museum mile and to think that you can do all the museums in one or multiple museums into one. So I think that there's an opportunity to rethink the relationship between the two, but I just wanted to make those short comments uh, because that's something you hit, you're hitting on many interesting issues that we're actually working on. So thanks, thanks for the comments. I don't know Salma if you want to say anything because usually the students remain a little silent, but Salma, you want to? No? All right. Well, uh, maybe I can, uh, I can jump in. Uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you to, uh, to your wonderful presentation, Salma. It really seems very cohesive. And thank you also for making these great comments, Marcella and, and uh, uh, Tom. Specifically, Tom, I think uh, what was scared me at most uh, at first was this uh, notion of infinite space, you know, that's also something about who that is big, you know, so <laughs> that uh, and physically, uh, how, how, how do we compute it, you know, so, so, so to speak. So I was really a bit, um, uh, it, it's a huge project, you know, you're not, you're not making your life easy by doing that. But I think we uh, discussed already what a kind of infinite spaces could be. So um, it's definitely something about perception. So uh, I think what you've done now is an, uh, a simulation of an infinite space, right? So it's, it's not the real infinite space, but it's simulation. And it's the simulation of these paintings. And um, in terms of the infinite space, I think repetition would be one aspect that makes it more continuous, you know, so probably so it's not necessary to make it really like an infinite space, but something that has aspects of an infinite space, which would be uh, something that is uh, repeating so many times that you lose reference. And uh, it's like, um, like, uh, like we discussed a maze where you, where you walk in the city of, of Venice, for example, and they all seem to be related somehow, they're affiliated, they're not exactly the same, but they have the same feeling and the same proportion of space probably you always go from a very narrow street into a huge plaza you know so and they, they vary in in scale and how they look like but at the end of the day you still get lost yeah so it's this um uh losing reference points and which uh in in probably in in computational in terms of a pattern could relate to noise right so it's, it's something where uh, the, the infinite space would be the noisy space and the patterns that would emerge out of this noisy space. And I think the same is for the, for the pictures. I think now you're making simulations of the pictures. I think you do a good job by translating the architecture uh, from its, from its, um, from its uh, um, recognition of patterns through this point cloud, yeah? Uh, and to recognize also what is the important movement or, or aspect of the building by establishing, okay, focusing on the, on the repetition of the spiral. Uh, but the paintings are just like left as they are. I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with the work of Mario Klingemann, an artist uh, who is uh, 
using these databases and database sets for, for, for paintings to generate art uh, using art, uh, machine learning. Uh, and I think uh, that's definitely something we can move forward uh, in, in, our, in our project. I, I think uh, specifically, if, if you think about it, uh, data scientists, uh, somehow for them, all data is the same, yeah? For them, uh, they get data sets and they have no clue probably what this specific algorithm model will do and what are the inputs and what will be the output. Sometimes you're looking for, for the outputs, but more likely is you actually look, looking for the bias of of the project, you know, the gradient descent or the, so um, what, what, uh, what is it the weights that the, the artist, I think that that's the encapsulation of the artist, the art, the architecture, the architect that is in the bias, you know, the bias can come from the data itself, but there's also a value that you add to this, uh, to these algorithmic values, which is always the bias and the weight weights of these neurons. So uh, that's that's something that you really have to figure out what does it mean uh, in terms of data retrieval. For them, uh, you could use the same model for two, diff two different types of, of problem solving. But uh, as an architect, how would you employ it? And would you want it to be the, the best way of how this algorithm works? Or should it be just the second best way how this algorithm works at the end. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, you wrote in very interesting uh, subject matter. Actually, we have been working at uh, Cooper for, with many students for many years, uh, how to retrieve data, and how to make it interactive so that it's not just that you're retrieving the data itself, but actually the data becomes the act of design. That's the entire uh, base of the studio because that what you call bias, I think is a very important term, especially in artificial intelligence, right? When you're uh, passing through information flows, uh, the bias equation, right? Is, I, I think that essential to actually think on how, what is it that you're waiting and why, and uh, how you get away from, the, uh, from data actually into information, right? Information theory and data is, can be problematized in terms of what you're saying. Uh, so I completely agree. The question is uh, relative to what Salma was showing about the Met, how the immersive quality actually presents a condition of the frame and how to escape that frame. But uh, also, Tom, you mentioned about uh, something I forgot to, to mention about, about the user experience. Uh, we're actually also working with Salma, the fact that each user will have a very different experience. Even if it is computed, the possibilities of the path, each path would be actually uh, infinite or the possibilities exponential in relationship to how each person is circulating. So Salma is actually working on uh, an equation in which the relationship between the forking path of Borges, but the individual perception of how you make those cho choices can actually uh, uh, open up what you call the vortex. To me, is the, what you call the vortex is the architecture between the virtual and the real. And that's the interface that we, we are trying to widen up. Uh, so I agree with, um, with the notions that you're actually uh, expressing because it's exactly that where we want to find the project. Uh, and in that sense, what we would like to happen in this studio is that the, the problem specificity and the computational specificity, right, they are correlated. That you, in other words, that you could not do this with some other project, or that some other projects cannot be activated through the technology. So we're trying to correlate uh, architecture with the computational uh, problem that we're looking at. So uh, great comments, Sandra and Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, Gustavo Nelson. Gustavo, you put some uh, phrases in the chat. I don't know if you want to. Oh, well, 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 I just wanted to thank, uh, you know, my previous, uh, I guess, panelists here, uh, Tom and Sandra and Mar Marcello, for their comments. <clears throat> I was very impressed with Marcello's summary, uh, Tom looking at the kind of this theoretical framework and how the arts and kind of this embodiment and relationship to 
these forms work and um, how Sandra actually spoke about the idea of data and virus uh, bias and also kind of the idea of retrieval, like what is data? Um, and Paolo, you talked about the idea of uh, looking at formulating an understanding of how all these can work together conceptually uh, with the idea of the infinite. And I guess, Selma, I'm going to do my, um, you know, uh, I guess in teaching, I'm going to do my, um, I want to hear from you a little bit about your motivation. Um, what formal principle or language did you want to evolve here? Because it's at early stages, but it would be nice for, for I think all of us who've been in architecture and media, there is a language out there. So are you looking at nature as a inspiration? Are you looking at the history of data, data analysis and structure? Or is there a new research focus? Like you found the intersections of, you know, media, traditional arts and architecture and data, and you found a new form. So I think I'm coming in it from a research focus in the sciences. Like what, what is your motivation for novelty? And then uh, of course you, it's impressive work. So like uh, I go back to the idea of uh, user experience. If this is a virtual, I think architects, I would say, are the first UI designers. Like everything is user experience. Uh, even if you sleep, it's a user experience because you need a something to sleep on, right? So can you speak about that? Uh, I guess your motivation, ideas, and what is novel, novel to you in this project as research? Uh, well, to me, for this project, it's mainly the experience of people inside of the space and how to make something that was intended to be achieved, but is not achieved physically to achieve it virtually and using computation and using data. So that's why I, I did the research about the idea of the spiral and how the architects kind of envisioned the space and how the unlimited growth can be um, created and made possible using this, uh, the virtual and using the navigation through the virtual, but also keeping in mind the physical space so that um, in each um, um, variations, even of the morphology of the space, I try to imagine it as it's layered in the building so that uh, it's a physical navigation inside of the Guggenheim. We are transforming the building virtually, but we are also experiencing it physically. Well, well, thank you. I guess um, I, I've been in the space of research of virtual reality and gaming for, I don't know, like over 20 years. So when you, when you speak, if I close my eyes and I hear you, I'm going, what is she trying to say? Because I principally want to understand at a research level, are you going for the abstraction? Are you going to looking at, you know, doing a web crawler, finding all the data, looking at the colors, the hues, the, the potential in geometry within the painting, the breaking of the frame to influence some of your spaces? Are you trying to look for a scheme for data extraction of the user? you know, looking at their metadata. I think um, there's, there's something that I learned uh, a long time ago when I talked to my students. Um, there's two things I share with them. The way that I'm looking at what they're trying to communicate is uh, something called QDOS. It's a uh, quickness, delivery, originality, and sting. Like what is the thing that is original and what is the thing that's so uh, wonderful and inspiring that I'm going to come back and think about your project all day and all night, right? And then uh, a sign, set, and statement. It's like, I see what you're communicating, but what is the larger statement? Like, how does it relate to a dialogue within what you're describing as research? And, and then what is the dialogue in the discipline? Because I think uh, we're at a point now that we have so much information and data and free books and audiobooks and lectures that you should always be in dialogue with the discipline. Um, and I, 
and I and I'm a little unclear about what that dialogue is. But what I do know is that um, in my experience in research here, there are users, <laughs> like there's basically people who think about the ideas, there's users, you as an artist using the tool, and you as a tool maker, like you're making the system. And those two are different. I've made small systems, but I'm not an engineer to make the entire system. Those individuals are in a different category of how they see architectures. So my dissertation was new media architectures. So, um, so the idea is that everything is in the spatial domain, even though it gets down to chemicals in our minds, you know, they're little firing synaptic things. But I come back to you and go, wow, there's so much potential. So what is the, the core thing that you want to explore creatively for yourself as a challenge? But then what are you trying to say to Wolf Pricks or to Tom Main or to, you know, uh, to Peter Eisenman or to, um, to all the deans in architecture school? Hey, I've arrived here and you should look at me. I have something to tell you. And this is what I'm telling you. So no pressure, by the way. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to provoke something from you. That's all. I don't know, Salma, if you want. I mean, it's a big question. Uh, the, to me, what we're trying to do, at, at, at least, um, well, number one, I don't believe in the star system. I think it's a, it's a problem in, in the United States in general uh, that uh, we identify architecture trends with certain people. Well, there are like millions of people that then are kind of uh, left away. Uh, I am a little bit uh, suspicious of that uh, reading of history, especially the last uh, maybe 20 years. And I'm, I work with Peter Eisenman, right? Uh, I was part of that. So I, I talk from within. Uh, but um, to me, uh, the relation between how architecture is and, what ar and how architecture is communicated is problematic in the world. It's problematic uh, at all levels and it's a function of capitalism, I, I think, right? So we have to be... Uh, a little bit more critical of why we are uh, liking what we are liking uh, and try to, and the, the, one of the reasons of this studio is to expand the possibilities relative to a problem, to identifying a problem. So before knowing uh, what you would like to do uh, in terms of aesthetics desires, I think first you need to unmotivate what, why you think you like what you like. Because uh, I think in general, architects, we are, we are full of desires. The desires are actually constructed by media. And if you're not aware that that construction is part of a mechanism of consumption, uh, you fall into the trap of uh, just uh, motivating the same means through which you are becoming a little bit of a consumer. Uh, in that sense, to me, the, the point of actually doing a 3D scan and focusing on uh, reality and doing a kind of uh, archaeological survey of what architecture has been so far is to actually open up problems that have been uh, actually forgotten and placed away and to intervene at discovering rather possible questions and possible problems rather than defining where do I want to go as an architect. So for instance, in um, in the sense of uh, opening up conditions, the, the there is a kind of discovery in each project that I would like to reinforce. And the discovery here uh, by Salma is on the problem of the Met as an, as an issue in itself. Uh, the Met, the painting being part of the painting or the frame and the, these painters that actually uh, motivate the relation between the, the viewer, actually thinking of the viewer there and being part of the frame uh, as, as, act, as activators of those problems. Um, you know, it happened actually with uh, Rembrandt painting, right? That they're in the Met, right? There are different types of relationships, different types of arts. And I think that uh, the objective here is to figure out a problem and to intervene in discovering an issue and actually try to expand that into a, an architectural project. Uh, by the way, we, we, one of the objectives of this studio and the program in general is to be able to, uh, for instance, and something I've been working a lot of years at the Cooper Union, to be able to present projects to the government or to present projects to, in this case, the Guggenheim. We're, we're trying to build up something that we can 
uh, uh, we can present to them as a potential for rethinking how their curatorial work may be doing, may be done, or what their museum is. Because I don't think that the curators actually, I can claim that I think that they don't know what the potential of their museum is because they don't understand the logic of their space and the relation between the space and the painting. And that happens in the Guggenheim and it happens in the Met. There's well, a think, lack of vision in that sense. Well, th I think that's what I'm, I was trying to hit on. So thank you, Pablo, for, for clarifying. I think, I think Selma, uh, you have a wonderful leader here, and I think that's how you should be leading what you're presenting. Hey, this is what we're doing. You know, this is how we see the framework. I'm going to look at the data, problematize what I see as a scientist. I'm, a, I'm an observer, I'm analyzing, and then I'm posing the question. And the question is, boom, you know, I'm actually making this path because I'm doing an archaeological, you know, study. You know, um, recently I've been reading like uh, Foucault and Jameson and the idea of different, you know, eras of time in architecture and philosophy. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, what is she trying to, to critique here? And, and Pablo, what you're trying to say should be a paper, like this is a studio paper or a paper critiquing the system of architectural design, consumerism, and the curatorial process. So I think for me, um, all successful because it problematizes what I think we all know is that uh, museums are not successfully communicating to the viewer, especially now during the times of pandemic. So how do we get more uh, motivated or embodied uh, relationships to the data slash art inside the museum? So thank you, Salma. I, I, I don't want to take any more time, Pablo, but no, I thanks. really that's, enjoyed that's the, the I really enjoyed the conversation. Maybe Nelson, you want to say something? So and then we pass to the next student because uh, we I mean okay. I'm actually happy that we have a very deep uh, review because it's a midterm review. Uh, so I don't mind. Uh, we are a little bit uh, exhausting our reviewers, but if you don't mind, uh, if you can stay the longer the better. But I th I'm enjoying a, a deep conversation. Uh, instead of like very short time conversation. But Nelson, go ahead. I got it. Uh, I don't know where to begin. There's a lot of stuff in that book. And um, uh, there's a lot of layers to it. Like there's a historical layer, a, a, a philosophical layer with the dialectic. There's a, the technical layer, the, the whole computation thing. Um, but I think what stuck with me was, I, I got three questions though, but what stuck with me and why I think it's a great, project it's a great idea because it's basically kind of like redirect the direction that the internet has taken like i for one think we don't have the internet because i experienced it in the 1990s and it's it looked nothing like what we have now so it, it gets what we have now it's practically the opposite like we have bubbles of people that think this way and the internet was born out of the idea of sharing stuff, meeting people that are halfway around the world and learning from them. So it's, it's quite contradictory. So I see this project as a cultural move into like getting, not just getting people interested in, in you know, the paintings and art in, in the cultural project that is uh, Kandinsky, the Met, um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, the, the Guggenheim and all that. So I, I think it's great in that it's a, it's a good, uh, of half first step because uh, uh, it remains to be seen if like had like if, if this project is done uh, if we start like charging membership and stuff like that then it's thrown out the window so <laughs> that, that's the way I'm looking at it so but uh, I think the the thing that stuck with me it's the, the infinite part like I didn't understand really like when you were when you were describing it but after Gustavo and everybody else's intervention, I got, I started getting the sense that you were talking about infinite space in the sense of bigness, because infinity is very, is a very vague concept. And you, you can have like infinity and bigness and infinity in, in, in subdivisions, for example. And Cantor demonstrated that there, there are a lot of, of there's a hierarchy of, of infinities. So, uh, so there's infinities in infinities, and you know, and so forth. 
uh, I got a couple of recommendations for you to read. If you're going to stick with that uh, as a driver, um, one is to, I mean, you can go back from like going backwards from Turing to go to Girdle to Cantor to Hilbert. So that they all, and Russell too. Uh, it, it, I think the, the, the painting in the museum and the museum and the painting thing make, makes, me, makes me think about uh, the Russell's paradox um, in which you have the set of all sets, but if you have the set of all sets, then there's a set that contains them all that's not in the set. So that, that's, a, that's a contradiction, it's a paradox. Uh, it's very well known in mathematics. And uh, if you want to read about that, I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not, I'm not gonna sketch out the details. But I think it was worked out by Frankel. I don't, I don't remember how, how he, he circumvented that problem. But it stalled set theory for like 40 years. <laughs> so between him, between Russell and, and, and Gödel, they, they, they single-handedly just tore it down. Um, so there's that. Uh, yeah, any paper by those authors, especially uh, there's a good Medium article about Georg Cantor and the the infinity hierarchies, like I can try to find it and paste it in the chat. Um, so two, three questions. In the context of this ver uh, augmented reality, I don't know how to call it, uh, so for museum, like video game-ish museum, what is a user? What uh, is infinite or is it infinite? Like really or and, and if it's not, which factually speaking, it is, we, the world is finite. Um, uh, so yeah, if, if, if it is you know, not infinite, like why, what is the, the purpose of using infinite in the, the sort of the pitch of the project? Like what, what do you want to say with that metaphor? Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, Salma. What I did is I put some links on the chat so that if you want to refer to get more precise in your definition of infinity and the objectives of the project. Actually, uh, I'm glad that this is coming up because in the history theory seminar, we are actually looking at uh, mathematical uh, papers and actually we're actually scripting through mathematics. Uh, and one of the problems that we are looking at in relationship to computation is a halting problem in relationship to Gödel's theorem. So we are we are trying to address them, but Salma brought it up in relationship to Borges. And it's funny that Borges is quoted by many scientists also, right? Uh, because and I, I was a little bit like to trigger the imagination, but at the same time to actually physically do it through computation. That's why we're doing uh, cellular automation. Uh, right, so we are actually activating those problems at the theory level, but also at the computational level uh, uh, in in kind of precise uh, ways, right? And that's why Salma is working with a spiral. But yeah, Nelson. Yeah, well, I just wanted to add that Borges was a, a math enthusiast. Like he would just like solve. Actually, like, works for, for fun. Well, what, what you pointed out about the the uh, infinite at a, at a, a, at a small scale is the book of sand, right? And also uh, the the combination of the letters, right? So we're trying to do that with the bits uh, in a, in another project, uh, the project by Yusuf. We're actually trying to work that out in terms of bits and spaces. So there's yeah. an interesting paradox uh, concerning that. It's called the Banach-Tarski paradox, which deals with the, the uh, uncoupling. Uh, a sphere and then recoupling it, you know, and, and like, even though that the sphere can be divided in infinite points, you know, like, how do you do that? And, and they demonstrate that it's possible. Well, actually, so we, we look at that. And also, also um, since you're interested in set theory, we look at knots uh, and mathematical knots. So we're trying to figure out the, Salma is trying to figure out the multiple connections, not only in kind of intuitive ways, but in terms of mathematical terms relative to uh, knot theory, uh, relative to two colors. Uh, so to, to understand topology relative to possible combinations, which maybe at a certain point opens up what Tom is referring to about the threshold or the vortex. Uh, we are actually conscious about it. And I think that that's what activates the, the voids in between the different paths, because it's not going to be center periphery, but it's going to be, uh, in terms of what you're saying, Nelson, 
the in inversion of the sphere is a problem of a knob theory problem, right? That the inside and outside can be reversed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. So you're, what you're getting at. You, you probably... Uh, there, there's there's a couple of, of, of papers uh, running around that deal with the um, uh, what's it called? Uh, it, it's it's not the topology in itself, but but it's it's the way to to basically address non manifolds. You know, well, there's manifolds which are like normal, let's say, quote unquote, to make it short, normal surfaces, and then non manifolds, which are surfaces that are, are allowed but are not supposed to exist in reality. So and 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 the way that you can work around them and representation can tell you things about like how how real manifolds can can well can, I don't remember the authors I'm I'm gonna look that up and I'm gonna but also I mean if you think about topology topology is a higher dimensional relationship right so mm -hmm. we, uh, I I would like Salma to get into topological problems through not theory because it means that in virtual space you can actually do it even if it is reduced in dimensions mm -hmm. but you can do it in terms of relationships uh and that's something that i would like uh, to salma to do related to what tom is saying about the vortex because uh to me topological relationships that are not you cannot actually project them into three dimensions but they are they present the possibility of creating yeah. connections that are yeah, not yeah, yeah. uh right yeah. but anyways we need to Oh, sorry. There's a way that engineers yeah. use all the time to solve that kind of thing, like the relationship between A, B, and C, and D, even though A, a and D are not related. Uh, it's called graph theory. Like you, you should probably, or, uh, Salma should probably read a little bit about that too. Like they, they, they use that all the time. But, all right. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. So now we, we actually did a very in deep review of Salma uh but um we don't want to abuse the reviewers uh, time so uh let's jump into the next project uh yusef you want since we were mentioning i like leaving the the order open uh, in terms of the conversation i think now is a good moment to have yusef projects thank you salma great work uh hello my name is uh, yusef ismail um I graduated from the Arab Academy in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, I've actually been lucky enough to start my project before coming here in Egypt. So I've done all the surveying in, uh, in Cairo, in historical Cairo. Is my screen showing? Yes. So uh, my project is uh, situated in uh, Cairo. Specifically in the uh, Al Gamalaya district, Al Maza Street. So uh, Al Maza Street is basically um, was the center of the city of the historical uh, city in Cairo, and it's shown here. It's got so many monuments. It's a uh, it's um, the biggest uh, open air museum in uh, in the Middle East. Actually, we got so many Islamic monuments, and the one that I was very interested in are the Sabil and Kutabs. A Sabil and, and Kutab is a two-story building consisting of a public water dispensary on the ground floor, and then a, a library and a school on the, on the upper floor. And this very weird combination stems from the um, teachings of Islam, actually. I've mentioned some, um, some verses of Quran here and uh, some of the Prophet Muhammad's uh, sayings, mentioning how important providing uh, water is, and this was due to the um, like very harsh climate of the region, of the Arab region. So the water was very scarce. Uh, also, it was mentioned so many times in the Quran and in uh, Muhammad's teachings that uh, providing education is better than actually doing a, a good, like, and this is like the, the best form of deed you can do, providing education to someone that, that does not have access to education or so on. So. And the, the goal of Islam, the goal of Muslims is getting to heaven through doing good deeds. So basically the building is combining two of the highest rank good deeds that a person can do, providing education and then providing water. So we have here the um, Al street. These are the, 
the four existing uh, Sabil the buildings. I'm working on uh, number one. And they have this kind of uh, linear organization. Expanding on this, um, the Sabil has been uh, evolving throughout the ages. Like in the beginning, if you can see here, this is actually the Sabil. It's, it's like a part of the mosque. It was never, it never had the emphasis or the importance of being on its own. In a later age, it started having this kind of exclusion. Then it got more emphasis. And finally, in the one I'm working on, it's a standalone structure. So it, that's probably in six, six, 1600s. I'm not sure. Anyway, so like, this is the Mamluki era. So this is where people were actually, uh, like the, the Islamic uh, the Islamic countries actually had the, the, the money and the resources to, to, to do this kind of monuments, standalone monuments, instead of having them embedded in a structure. These are the 3D scans. I started by, uh, by facing the building itself. And I was interested in, in how the perception of the building is different facing it like uh, frontally or coming from the side streets. Because you don't really realize that the, the street is diverging unless you come facing it forward. Looks like a, like one continuous street doesn't, doesn't really put any emphasis on the uh, Sabil itself. Then I tried to do to um, show some possibility of, of the uh, point cloud representation. Like this is on the inside of the of the sabil, like in between of in between of the uh, walls. So you would never be able to, to see some something like that without having a point cloud. And I find this very interesting. This is the three layers of the street. Like this is the um, the buildings on the right, the sabil in the middle, and then the buildings on the left of the street, all in overlapping. Uh, Yosef, sorry to interrupt. Is this uh, the point cloud is through photogrammetry or what type photogrammetry. of LIDAR? Got no, no, got photogrammetry. It. Got yeah. it. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we're okay. actually uh, getting a, a, live, a LIDAR a laser scanner, actually. Uh, it's going to be here hopefully next semester, uh, but we were delayed. But that's the idea. The idea is to work with LIDAR. So, um, like I was saying, uh, this part, the upper part is the uh, library school, and the lower part is the uh, lower floor, is the uh, water fountain or water dispensary. So going back to Borges, which was my uh, main reference, the first, actually the, the first sentence that the book starts with, the short story starts with, is the universe, which others call library, is composed of an indefinite, perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries. So I started actually doing intuitive deformations and transformations to the Sabil, to the tower, turning it into a hexagon, and then trying to explore his concept of infinite. And by the way, he that the whole story is told by, like he, he is a user in the, in the story, so it's told by him. So he thinks it's infinite and everyone thinks it's infinite, but no one actually knows if it's infinite or not. So it's just that the point of view of the um, of the writer, or actually the user in, the, in that case. And then uh, going back to the water, this is a verse of the Quran, uh, and we created from water every living thing. Will they not believe? Then believe. So water is a very very big part of Islam and of the Arab culture in general, due to the territory. So I started doing the um, water flow simulation based on the topography, the original topography of the area. And then with the existing uh, urban fabric, then tried combining the two. So th these are actually the intersections of the water flow 
um, of the topography with the water flow um, of the, uh, throughout the urban fabric, throughout the streets that currently exist. I actually decided to work on this node since it's actually directly connected to the um, existing Sabil, to the existing tower. And I took each node, I took each, um, like the network, each end, end, end of the node and had these um, like specific spots for the start of my uh, library, like how, how it would stem, stem from. This is actually into. Uh, this is also intuitive. I started the distribution of the uh, towers along the uh, nodes of the water simulation. And then I started thinking that it doesn't really make sense that the, all the towers are going to be the same. So why not have the water flow influence the, the actual number of points in the point cloud? So the further the water flows or travels, the more points are washed off or in computer terms called or, or deleted. So as you can see here, the further, this is the, the where the water extends, the further the um, water flows, the less points there are. And this is done randomly through the, uh, through an equation. So every time you run the water flow and the longer the water flow runs, the more points are, are, are deleted and uh, each and every time you get a, a different result. Then I started applying the um, motion cubes algorithm to deform the topology of the, uh, of the towers, of different towers. So you can still, still see the shape of the tower, like an abstract shape of the tower, but each and every tower is, is special and different and unique. And if I run the algorithm now, it's gonna give me like another possibility of, of the topology other than the one I have here. So where we are now is if we say that according to Borges, the characters are random. So his characters are my points. If the points make up the the point cloud or the uh, whole structure of the uh, tower, then the, the tower is the book or the text. All of the towers are the library, but then I did, well, I still don't have the infinite. I, I just have separate libraries. This is where I started working with the uh, cellular automation. These are just examples of the uh, of the forms I got in the beginning. These are made of just uh, the, the these are stemming from the point clouds, but just one tower, not the not the combination of towers. I then started the, exploring the possibility of having continuous surfaces, so that the the flow of the users would be continuous without like with nothing stopping them from one space to another. This is the evolution of the plans. Um, sections. These are actually each stage of the uh, growth of the uh, cellular automation based on the point clouds and the, the spread of the point clouds on the uh, on the water flow, on the nodes of the water flow. These are sections and these are the plans, which actually actually started making spaces, like actual actual spaces. And here I coded the uh, Borges again. I have just written the word infinite. I have not included that adjective out of mere rhetorical habit. I hereby state that it is not illogical to think that the world is infinite. So he, he's not really sure. He, it's just a theory. The 
then this is the combination of all the towers, applying the cellular automation on, on all the towers together and how they merge and, and make up this continuous um, surfaces and continuous uh, library. Actually, the growth of these of the um, the library and the generations of the cellular automation are informed by uh, live data and uh, using Python that uh, retrieve live the, the the current population of the Egyptians and and retrieves the uh, the number of books that actually exist the the books that get published published every single second through this these two websites and Python. So the library's growth or ever growth uh, is depend is dependent on the population and the number of books being published. So whenever a book is published or whenever the population actually grows, the library grows with it. But we just know that the user is not going to know that. that the user thinks everything is infinite. These are more plans of each level. I then started to explore the possibility of having the uh, the library actually go underground as well, because one of the lines in the story from any hexagon, one can hexagons are in the libraries from any hexagon, one can see the floors above and below one after another endlessly. So it didn't really make sense that I have a ground floor like a a, a base a base plane that you can just look downwards and find just find the floor that don't doesn't have a continuity down, uh, below. So I starting I started doing the um, having the growth upwards, informed by the um, by the number of books and the users, and then the growth downwards, informed by the length of the uh, water of the water flow. And this is how I imagine the library is going to be, like being interconnected and infinite, doesn't have a beginning or nor an end. Um, and all spaces are connected. This kind of summarizes the whole project. So if, if we start with the water flow and the point clouds, um, it then informs the marching cubes. The marching cubes are the beginning of the uh, Cellular automation, the first generation, second generation, more generations, getting to the final uh, final form. And this is the um, the project in in relative or versus the existing urban fabric of Cairo of the area. This is the water flow. The nodes and then the project itself at the current state, which if run, if run again is going to be different. These are the stages of the uh, of the project project as well. Water to the distribution of the watching cubes turning into the uh, cellular automation, and then growing into different generations into the, the final form.
and this is also a summary of the uh, whole product. So through photogrammetry, we got the point clouds, the power, running the water flow simulation. I could distribute the, uh, the towers on the nodes. More distance means less points, less dense distance, more dense point clouds. Then applying the merging cubes, different generations. The, the higher grows, the, the the relationship between the the growth and the um, and the amount of books and the population is uh, a direct relationship. So the more books we get, the more books get published, the more the bigger the library grows. And that's everything. Thank you. Thank you, Musa. Yeah, Gutao, please. Uh, all right, let, let me start it, Yosef. Thank you very much for, uh, obviously there's a lot of work here and uh, you have a lot of energy. I can already say, I can already see that. I have two questions. Um, can you go back to the diagram describing how you are you're doing what you're doing because uh i think uh you made a lot of i think in my line of work you made a lot of claims and uh it's better to under promise and over deliver than to to make this huge statement but when you go back to the a good diagram when it comes to explaining how you're going to and i'm looking at the labeling where you have the letters uh letters document infinity symbol and and thing i wanted to walk through your your thought getting to the algorithm that one right there so um when i look at this diagram i can see how you're laying down a framework so uh i can understand the infinity sign a little bit now that you explained at the end and can the motivations on the symbol on top. And I can almost get to the, you know, the, the tower kind of typology, whatever this thing is. But point clouds and letters, that's not true. Uh, I, uh, point clouds are just data. So I, I think that you would get a richer project, I think, if you focused on how if you want to get the letters to the point cloud, what of the point cloud is a language? Because there are certain disciplines that they spend, you know, so much time studying language and just like what each symbol means. So um, that really caught me by surprise. But going down to the second, I think if you keep going down, I wanted to understand kind of the motivation, like what was the initial need uh, in the city or in this context that motivated you into saying this is a problem? Because I think that would help me understand why you want to have a dialogue between this inf infinite space that is tied to water and motivation and knowledge, but then the letters kind of muddle the message. So I, I put a lot of text in the chat here so, so you can see it. Like scale would be one thing. Like I would say um, it's so big that it would probably cripple the entire country into making such a building if it's to the scale that I think it's. It's probably four cities at once. Yes, it's, a, it's scary. I also uh, uh, react against that, right? But, but it would be cool if you had uh, a gallery space that was 5,000 square feet and you made it out of cardboard or something. And you would experiment in living in that space, just even like a little space. I think you would benefit. Like, I think when I have designed buildings or structures before or environments, I put myself as... Uh, a child, as a teenager, as an adult, and as more of an elderly adult. Like, how do I uh, live in the space? And I love small spaces. I ride motorcycles, by the way. So I think for me, the cars that I like are small, compact, or open and free. Like, you're, you're flying like a superhero. So I, when I look at this, I go, all right, the letters is an issue, but that's fine. 
I think you can make a dissertation going from the letters to the document. That to me is a few dissertations. So that's how big you're trying to take this problem. And I love your ambition. But then scale is a big one. I remember, um, I think one project I proposed in my graduate studies, uh, Greg Lynn said, wow, you have a great, great project, but you have no concept of scale. You have no understanding of what's really happening in there in the real world. And I'm going, this isn't a real world project, but there should be fundamentals on how people want to inhabit or use the space. So I don't want to take any more time, but I compliment and I support all the energy that you put into this. But understand, this isn't about answers. This is about you've provoked a lot of problems that are open problems in the discipline and in different fields. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Let me answer the part about, about the. Uh... I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh... I just need to, to answer that. Sure, sure, sure. Please answer. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, also, Gustavo, you were asking about the uh, motivation and why this place might need this kind of structure or why a library or. So it was very obvious to me coming from where I come from, from Egypt. Even I come, I come from Alexandria, actually, even though it's the home of the, of the Library of Alexandria, the famous Library of Alexandria, I've barely ever been able to get inside of it because of the very strict uh, rules that they follow and they have limited numbers of, even before COVID, they have limited numbers of visitors every day and the lack of public spaces we have in Egypt. This is a very big problem in Egypt. And the lack of, um, of accessibility to, to education and to we don't have libraries. We don't actually have any public libraries. You have to be enrolled in a university, actually in a, in a private university, to be able to go somewhere and, and find the book and read. So I found this very interesting that it's tackling an inner problem in Egypt. If we cannot change what the government is doing, I don't, I don't want to go to the political side, but if, if we cannot change that and we don't have the power to change that, what if we can change it virtually and actually have give access to each and every book that everybody wanted to someday wanted to find or read through the virtual space, which is actually the, the I think all of us are, do, are trying to do in this studio. We're trying yeah. to unlock the potential of the visual, the, the virtual reality that at least at the moment is not uh, possible to, to construct or to, to do in the actual world, at least at my level. So I, I compliment you I for, don't know your, this, for your motivation. This, yeah. No, I compliment also, you for your motivation. Also, yeah. Gustavo, uh, Yusef was uh, trying to articulate the Arab Spring problem related to social media. And uh, we're trying to figure out uh, if there might be a way. But I agree with Gustavo what you're saying, that there are a lot of claims that are kind of he heroic. And then there's a lot of jumps, right? And there is a lot of uh, territory to cover. But I think that the motivations are very interesting and, and they kind of work, at least for me, conceptually they work, but we need to try to tie them back together in a different way. Uh, like I think that the relation between the water and the books is a, is a very interesting problem, uh, especially in, a, in an arid area, right? Where uh, the relationship between access to water is life or death. Uh, and Yusef is saying that books is the same and that the government is covering that access, right? And therefore, is the is actually hitting on a nerve on the lack of development on certain aspects in the area, right? The access to education is an elite uh, problem, right? So the library there works very well for me. But then I agree with you. I'm not sure if the letters and the point cloud can be related, but it's a way to think about uh, the atomization of the character relative to Borges. And the problem is that it's a metaphor. And I would like to avoid the metaphor and actually to figure out exactly where the character is, where the bit is of information, and how we can relate the bit of information related to the construction of the library. What is the block? Uh, in other words, what's the building block here? Uh, and the water, in that sense, to me, could become more articulated in relationship to that. Uh, because we're talking about like the drop of water in relationship to the flow of the water. So there's a lot of very interesting concepts, but they need to be more uh, placed together in a more precise way uh, relative to the process. 
I would like to jump in, into, uh, uh, into both of your arguments. Thank you so much, both. And thank you so much for presenting your uh, great work. Uh, Yusef, I, I, I think I was very impressed with uh, the, uh, that the, you implemented some, uh, some aspects of decay into your project. When I go to this pound cloid density directly related to the length of the connection node, the further the water travels, the more points are washed off. So I think that is uh, to create infinite space. I think you already established a method how to create it because you implement a, a sort of element of decay. So, um, so your, uh, your project is more about uh, mutation and decay creating infinite space rather than uh, creating uh, infinite growth of the space, you know? So not, uh, not it's, it's not about, uh, getting it bigger and bigger and bigger, but more informed and informed and informed through these processes, right? And decay is one of those processes. So that is that equals life. So I, I think that's something that you can totally uh, encode then into your project. Uh, and some aspects I was thinking about also is probably not um, creating spaces, but rather organizing spaces. So let's think about that all the information is there. Everything we need to know is already existent. It's just how to connecting them. And that's part of, of the, of the uh, outcome of the studio to, is to create those interfaces. So how could you use those as an, as an interface uh, uh, that is organizing all the information that is there. I don't think there is no bookstores in Alexandria, uh, Yusuf. Is that correct or? Um, we have bookstores. Uh -huh. uh, we do have bookstores, but they're usually very expensive. We have very, like all the imported things are, are very expensive in Egypt. So like if you want to get a, a book that so all we need here is, is ten dollars. So it's not it's not accessible. Yeah, like I, I would not buy a book in Egypt. I would actually yeah. tell my friends to get to get me a book coming back from outside. But, but we do have bookstores. But so not, I was but thinking, not I was thinking about, about more about Kindle now. <laughs> so uh, we just need one book. You know, you, we just need one of those interfaces where these letters start to appear and they start to make sense through grammar and shaping them and organizing them. And so can our uh, uh, the spaces that you correlate to them. So they become also more informed through information processes, right? So I think uh, what you need to give to the, to the people in Alexandria and in Northern Africa or in Africa in general is uh, giving them an uh, interface for informational systems. And uh, Kindle could totally uh, be the, the book, you know, is it, is it just, would it be just, uh, a political problem, you know, that there is the one book, of course, that you also quote here in this presentation, and there is uh, the, the the one book that stores all the information. I was very happy when I when the first Kindle came out. I was super excited to get one because I, I mean, as much as I love the haptic, the, the object itself, the book, the smell, something that cannot be translated yet into the designed uh, object, but I. I so love the idea of having all the books that I take and I can move everywhere, right? It's, it's, uh, and I can, uh, but, but uh, I think what we we then want to go from this point is not storing only information and having the data, but also generating something through that data. And that would be something to machine learning processes. And the same would be the application of, of, of growing, you know, growing architecture, not in the sense of, of uh, making it bigger and larger and taller, but really making it more informed, making it more responsive, making it more accepting, but also creating. But you know, Sandra, since you're pointing out uh, to the to the one book, have it all. I, I totally agree. It's a book of sun that you know you can have one one you know hyper book. But the the question is how space. I think space is still relevant in that combinatory logic. Mm -hmm because uh, the, the function of the library is not so much to actually get the book that you want, but actually to get lost and not get the book that you want and, and look at other books that are around the book. And that's where I think the space would make sense relative to that, uh, that, that there is both, right? That is a combinatory informational aspect, 
but you also have a kind of cloud of books that are related to that book that you can visualize and that you can retrieve from other libraries. And then I don't even think about books. I really think more about YouTube movies that are there, there like, and movies, uh, documentaries. I mean, there is so much more information that is uh, 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 retrievable through, through this new form of media and these new forms of data agglomeration and, and compressing data. I agree about this great potential of looking at this matrix, not so much as a physical matrix of connections that I move through here and there and I see another library, um, but actually the, the potential of profiling, like when you're searching through, whether it's a series of YouTube links, there's all kinds of random connections that seem random, but maybe within the profiling algorithms are not so random. They're based on patterns and previous kind of uses. Um, and I think potentially as a kind of, um, just maybe looking forward before a couple of comments about what it is you've done and how you've done it and what else you can do. I think there's a there's great potential for the kind of virtual movement and experience through these uh, links. And they don't have to be so linear as to I move through here and there. Um, and I, and I agree with the comment, uh, Gustavo, you're mentioning space grammar, and I have my uh, first kind of question about, like, what are the patterns that begin to occur within this um, repetitive matrix, uh, which has, you know, differentiation built in it. Um, I think it's a bit alarming looking at the scale. I, I agree with Gustavo that uh, when you inset or superpose your project on the kind of on the granularity of Cairo's urbanism. It's rather alarming. And I think there, there's potential for just that or whether it's a kind of virtual relate set of relationships of points within an association between the, the granularity of an uh, informality effectively of uh, the matrix of Cairo. Uh, oh, sorry, of the, of the urbanism of Cairo of this particular part of the city. Um, and how does the, 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 the kind of reality or the weird mixes of realities um, begin to, to pop up in, and how do you establish those realities between the kind of fabric of Cairo? Uh, I think there's still some work to, to do in what those relationships are. And that's why I say it's a bit alarming seeing your megastructure, you know, landing on Cairo. And I know it's not meant as a kind of um, literal or even final kind of configuration, and that's not the ambition of the studio either. Um, going backwards a little bit to the beginnings of what you set up the project, um, forgive me if I'm being very literal about what your references are to Borges about the indefinite hexagonal galleries. When you start to work with the hexagonal figure or transformed hexagonal figure of what you've scanned, uh, of the Tower of the Sabil, and I somehow anticipated that when you begin to work with that, there would be, um, rather than uh, an automatic um, uh, orthogonal grid that you begin to develop as um, within a cellular automata and a spaces that you're, you're working with, that you would establish maybe a more uh, triangular or hexagonal grid. And forgive if this is a very literal um, interpretation of, um, uh, the hexagonal galleries, but it's so direct as an image, geometrically and mathematically, and you already begin to work with that. Uh, and I think that the potential of a fully three-dimensional uh, triangular grid has um, what you're doing in lofting. I, I, I can't annotate, but what you have on screen has these lofts that connect one, one space to another, rather than through um, the orthogonality, but establishing some, some kind of spatial relationship with greater continuity. And I think you'd have that embedded within the matrix um, uh, if it were already having diagonals within it in, in, in section and full three dimensions. But for, you know, forgive me if this is an overly uh, literal reading of, of the potential of the indefinite hexagonal galleries. I think a, you know, just to sort of, you know, go back to the, the reading of Cairo and how the informality of Cairo's urbanism might be 
uh, established here. Your reading of the sabils is that there are two ways of experiencing in motion uh, these sabils. One is about how the sabil is subsumed in the city. We don't really see it. It's continuous as a wall or surface. It doesn't pop out. It doesn't stand out. It's contiguous. It's integrated. And a second is uh, when the sabil becomes a discrete entity. It's a building. It's an object. Um, it's individuated. It's, it's visible. Uh, recognizable, uh, and in ways that the potential for these discrete water points might be moments where your project is um, uh, is discrete, and at other moments it's sort of embedded and more continuous within the fabric of Cairo's urbanism. There's potentially this very strange flipping between the kind of realities of Cairo's urbanism that maybe you have to go back and scan a bit more, um, and your, your um, imaginary or, or virtual matrix. Uh, and I, and I, I just, I, I don't really have an image of what that means or how it can be articulated, but it might have these, these extremes between the embedded, continuous, contiguous, integrated kind of um, uh, potential of your project and how it pops out as a sort of discrete and unique moments. Um, and I hope that's that's in some ways helpful because I'm trying to kind of make sense of your observations, your work, its potential, its potential for virtuality. Actually, well. Tom, uh, we were the, actually, I, I was totally for that because to me it's problematic to think about the tower alone if in reality the, the actual original version is that sometimes it's a tower and sometimes it's embedded within the fabric of Cairo. Uh, so one, one of my, my ambitions uh, relative to Yusef project was actually to develop multiple relations between object and fabric, but also oh, in terms of what Sandra is saying, because sometimes the object is added and is isolated, so it's a growth mechanism, and sometimes the fabric is kind of eroded and replaced by a condition of uh, inserting a, a kind of new organizing factor within an informal Kind of uh, settlement condition. So there is the formal and the informal and the growth and the decay. They could actually work uh, a little bit in terms of what uh, Yusef is now doing, which I think is actually I agree with the comments, which is the library is growing up and then the water is kind of eroding and taking removing ground out. Right? You could do that at the level of the urbanism. You can do uh, additive elements that reorganize spaces around because the informal will actually be affected by the position of an object. And the other way around, you can actually unmotivate growth and that be the intervention, right? So it could be void frame, frame object and object non-object versus growth and decay. So I'm just trying to articulate the, the two things because actually something that I, at least I am bothered by the typology. If the type is remains the same, to me it's a problem, uh, because then we're just adding uh, repetitive elements, even if they look variable, they're not variable at the typological level. And that's when I become suspicious of aggregate systems. I always criticize aggregate systems uh, because they are not truly evolutionary. If uh, you are in an evolutionary system, truly, the typology never remains the same, right? There is a relationship between type and topology uh, relative to growth that I think can be actually activate uh, what we are discussing here. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And also, if you think about it, the relation between the, the elements, the architectural elements and the water could actually be much, much more subversive that is not one system and the other system running in parallel, but the two systems compete with each other. And that actually, <laughs> actually we, we did that at Cooper, we did that with uh, in, in New Delhi with an uh, informal settlement actually, because CA uh, has, uh, there are some papers going around about CA, uh, obviously replicating certain rules, replicating growth and the game of life is actually literally that, right? A relationship between growth as a as a kind of other organism, but also growth site based, which means that the site conditions would motivate or not motivate growth. Relative to what Sandra you were saying, yeah. 
Yeah, I was just saying two competing systems is a GAN. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we need for Alexandria GANs and VPNs. Yeah, you know, the, the reason why we didn't start with machine learning yet is that I wanted, I, I am purposely relating um, histories of theories of computation and we are in CA, like literally in time and space, and we're getting into machine learning in the following weeks. Uh, but I wanted, you know, in reality, we're, we're delayed, but uh, I wanted to see if there could be a way to activate history and theory in relationship to why we're doing what we're doing instead of directly working with uh, machine learning and guns without knowing where they come from, you know? Yes, absolutely agree here. <laughs> But GANS, I mean, GANS is very interesting what you're saying because GANS is literally uh, data science and computer science articulated, right? So I'm not sure, in, I mean, in, in the case of Yusuf, it would be interesting, but in all the projects would be interesting to see how you weight the flow of data in relationship to uh, symbolic computation, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Nelson, well, welcome back. I don't know if uh, there are any other comments. Otherwise, we we jump into the, we're very delayed. So I, I'm enjoying a, a, a calm down, not rush uh, review, especially for a midterm. Uh, but I, have to say I need to leave your review yes. uh, sharply at one to meet my own students you know, across town. All right. So, Sorry. Yeah. So we can uh, let's let's see another project, uh, Farah. You want uh, because Kavya, you're having problems with the video, right? Do you want to present now or uh, maybe Farah? Farah, you go ahead. Make a short presentation so that we use the time of Tom, and then Tom can can leave. Maybe maximum 10, 15 minutes. Ten okay, minutes I'm actually. Sharing. Yeah. Okay, sharing my screen. Yes. Thank you. But Tom, please uh, feel free to leave whenever you need to. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I can stay till one. Uh, oh, thank you. That's that's great. Thanks. Uh, I'm Farah Jalil. Uh, I did my undergraduate in Bangladesh in School of Architecture, and I recently moved to New York. Um, the fact, uh, the problem that I'm looking into through this project is a problem that I actually faced uh, when I moved to New York. Uh, it's the image that I came with, and predominantly the image of sky, image of New York is <clears throat> the skyline. Um, I understand from my readings, uh, the inception of the skyline. I would like to quote the author, Cal Willits. Um, Extreme height has publicity value that equally benefits corporate or speculative owners. So I understand capitalism drives the verticality of New York. And, uh, technology. Uh, Manhattan's inception is the technology of the grid and then the technology of elevator. Uh, to quote, the elevator is the ultimate self-fulfilling prophecy. The further it goes up, the more undesirable the circumstances it leaves behind. Uh, so this problem of the image of skyline is uh, the people's experience or the people uh, in the street level or underground. Uh, the way I'm, uh, I'm looking through is uh, through the underground subway system. So um, the iconographic skyline of New York is connected at the deepest level by the underground subway transportation system. This root structure of the skyline is representative of how public transportation morphology is disassociated with the structures that they serve. The skyline thus becomes a threshold space between the public space and the private space. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to explore the dichotomy by deconstructing the skyline and reimagine it in, as a democratic structure for the people. Uh, the planes of the subway structure and the three dimensional of the structures above it in relationship to the mobility of people around the city can thus be simulated into an accessible virtual space. Uh, which I aim to present as a critic of inequalities that exist in reality. Uh, this diagram, uh, this uh, diagram shows the correlationship between. Um, firstly, I'm using uh, to see the problem I'm using the data of commuter movement and the density of people. 
uh, in a certain day in each sub in subway stations. So firstly, the density of subway station is higher in resp uh, with in correlated with the height of the buildings. Uh, this height of the buildings, it, this is the elevator maps, uh, elevator data, map generated from the elevator data. Mm, the dots get bigger where there is more density. So I established uh, the correlationship between uh, the subway station density and the high rise, the verticality of the buildings, the height. Um, uh, then again, the community density and the high rise density is also correlated. Uh, this is the um, commuter density and this is the elevator map. Both are seen to be uh, correlated. Um, this is again the uh, this is again the density of uh, people in subway stations. Uh, I I tried sketching a, a topological map of the density of people commuting, and uh, the higher the uh, higher the elevation of the density of the map is equal to the higher uh, is equal to, uh, related to the elevation of the buildings. Um, I tried seeing uh, because of the density, the variation of density of people using subway stations. I tried developing some knots. Uh, these knots are informed by the density of people using the subway stations. Um, Then I come uh, to the point where uh, through my readings, I would like to uh, propose uh, uh, the idea of bringing down the skyline to this underground or the subway. Uh, I would like to design two levels of it. Uh, a level would be a train to Kulas's uh, Coney Island. And another level would be uh, form follows people. Uh, for the train, for the train ride to uh, Kulas Coney Island, uh, what I, with uh, the data that I gathered, uh, I'm proposing the bringing down of the buildings, uh, the sky, uh, high rises into the into the subway cars through virtual reality, and the move uh, and which which is um, uh, which moves in real time with the commuter. Um, here, here I'm exploring some of uh, the ways I could displace the verticality. Uh, Farah, can you zoom in more into the videos because we don't see them so well. If you can zoom into this one. Yes, what is that? That's the form follows people, right? Follows people level two, which uses the elevator, uh, elevator to displace the um, skyline below or above while using the elevator car. Uh, because elevator is a technology that, that, uh, that drives the verticality of the high rises. Um, I would like to share two short animations.
uh, now the second level where form follows people. Uh, in an elevator car. Great, that's it, right? Thanks. Thanks, Farah. Thank that... you. Tom, you want to, since you have to leave, maybe you, you want to go first? You are muted. <laughs> oh, so di different than the other uh, projects. I'm, I'm uh, somewhat missing a position. Which position you're taking? Um, I think you know to focus on New York in terms of the skyline and and its verticality. The skyscraper is a totally appropriate kind of project to engage with, um, especially within the context of New York and its. Uh, Kind of monetizing of uh, and commodification of towers to an extreme with the pencil towers and such, um, and I'm a I'm a bit of a defender when people ask me what do you think about the new pencil towers and I say yes okay they're they're monuments to uh, the one percent um, zombie buildings etc I get all that the shadows on Central Park what I defend is the experimentation on the skyscraper and uh, about the skyline of New York. Uh, and generally about the, the extreme experimentation with extreme density. Um, and where I'm critical is maybe the, the ungenerosity of those buildings to the public and to anybody who doesn't have the budget to either own a piece of it um, or, or even have a view or any other activity within it. Um, I'm confused a little bit about the motivation of your project. Are you looking at the elevator as the as the technology which uh, can breed further innovation? Um, or is there a potential on experimenting with uh, a, a truly vertical architecture to an ex uh, uh, either an extreme that we don't know, or a verticality of the skyline of this discrete figures um, of the archipelago of uh, New York, where the Manhattan block in the extreme gets taken over about one vertical fi figure. And this is the this is the state of play in 1978 when of course Rem Koolhaas writes Delirious New York. And I think there's a potential for architectural innovation uh, of either the, the lateral connections between towers or another extreme of this, the city and its ground higher up. Um, and I'm not really sure what, what innovation that is that you're, you're proposing, which might mobilize other kinds of modes of motion and mobility uh, that aren't necessarily to do with the elevator. You know, one can say that, you know, if you, if you read um, uh, Rem Koolhaas's 1978 reading of uh, retrospectively or retroactively of, of Manhattan, you know, the elevator, electricity, you know, uh, are the triggers for uh, the invention of a new kind of architectural type, the skyscraper. Uh, and that becomes increasingly limited because of the numbers of elevators and the amount of the floor plate that you have to have to devote over to elevators and stairs just to be able to meet fire codes. Um, so what kind of innovation can you propose that allows this kind of extreme verticality of the city and its experience, um, both privately and, and publicly, uh, that maybe doesn't even rely upon the elevator that mobilizes other kinds of uh, motion. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking this question in a way because I don't really know the answer. It's not a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm asking it as uh, what motivates the project, whether you're experimenting on architecture that needs a new kind of way of moving through it, a new kinds of um, technologies, for example, or is this um, a transformation of the existing types of the of, of the skyscraper and of um, uh, so I, I don't know which which direction, which is it that you're coming from? 
the experimentation with architecture uh, that might require new kinds of mobility or the experimentation with the elevator, uh, which might generate further types um, and, and experiences of architecture. I, I think, uh, Tom, um, in relationship to uh, Farah having a position or not, I think the position is strong. The work is not as strong as the position because the position is that uh, Farah says that uh, Form Follows Finance is a vertical city, but that vertical city is dissociated from the horizontal movement of the subway city, right? The people that move in subways, uh, some people commute and take the elevator, but most people not, right? And that the skyline of New York, which is the kind of uh, expression that you are talking about, and I totally agree with you about the innovation in terms of infrastructure that are literally uh, infrastructure projects, the pen pencil towers. There are more than buildings, but the problem is that they are experienced only by the 1%. So what Farah, I think that the argument of Farah is actually to retrieve the experience of, I mean, I, I at least I actually had very few opportunities in my 20 years in New York to experience the verticality in New York. When you are there, it's really wow. You say, wow, this is New York. It's a different New York. There are New York bubbles, right? There are New York, uh, you know, you get to parties in, uh, 60 floor, right? And it's a different society that doesn't interrelate at all with the society that happens at the ground level. And I think that one of the arguments uh, that I can totally support by Farah, but I think needs more work, is how do you uh, bring the, actually the success of the verticality of New York to the ground level or to the, or to the total horizontal movement, which is a subway? Is that possible? Uh, is there a way to, uh, I think if I'm reading Farah's project, it's like if you're in the subway, first of all, it would be like a kind of navigation uh, application in which in the subway, you know what happens in the skyline, right? Uh, while you are in the subway as a kind of virtual reality projection. But then uh, from there, that's where the project starts. And, and, and then I think that the mobility problem comes in when uh, the perception of each person will have a different perception of the skyline when moving. Uh, that's what I feel that Farah is trying to do with the animations. But then I think with this, the elevator, I agree with you that I think that the elevator becomes normalized because we know that that happens when you go up, that you have that experience. But I think that the radical transformation would be to to think of the subway mobility in relationship to the skyline, uh, skyline experience. So in a way it's a displacement uh, in terms of mobility relative to experience. So uh, I, I, I think that that's an interesting argument. I would like to see how it looks like. And also from a navigation, like from a Google Maps point of view functionality, it would also work uh, interestingly to see if you can navigate differently the skyline of New York based on your geo position, right? Like what kind of transformation uh, you can have of the mobility in New York uh, by experiencing the city in a different way, right? But uh, Farah, I don't know if you had some problems working, but the, the level of production is not as great as you have been working on, but. Uh, I, I appreciate the animations that you're working on now. I think that they're they're kind of useful. So, yeah, Nelson, go ahead. Yeah, um, congratulations. I actually think it's a it's a it's a great question to work on. Um, for me, questions are more important than the answers. Uh, that said, I, I'm not sure that bringing holograms to to the New York subways the answer to the question of why certain people, like why does the CEO never see the people that he crushes when he makes a decision? Or why, you know, and why like rich people that get to live that sort of life uh, never actually see or, or th they don't even take the same transportation methods. So they, they never touch each other. So there's a very convenient separation uh, in the capitalist system, uh, which I think Faraz actually asking, confronting, and asking the question to, which is, for me, it's of fundamental importance uh, the, and, and, and a critique. The answer is kind of secondary, for at least from my perspective, because I'm, I'm not sure that 
what I appreciate about this project is that it's actually dealing with it. It's actually trying to frame the question in the right way. And it's using data to do that. So it's kind of like hacking the system in a way, like using their own production, because Google's the most capitalistic enterprise in the world, um, probably just probably second to Facebook, which is more like techno feudalism <laughs> than capitalism. Uh, so I think it's it's a great it's a great project in that sense. So it's a great political statement, and I think and I actually think it, it takes a bit of courage to kind of like step outside the norm in terms of like the way we take for granted that the city works, you know. And and uh, for me, for that reason alone, it's, it's deep already. Uh, then there's a I mean I don't know I th think the answer needs to be worked on. Um, I, although I think it's just interesting as a technological project, uh, you know, how do you get uh, the holograms in real time down to like? Oh, but you're right, Nelson. I think what, what Nelson, what you're saying is that, and and I, I have a, a, I think that the problem is that we don't have a discovery yet on that. Really, that's why. You yeah. see, to me, to me, the uh, <laughs> that, uh, exactly. So if you hit on the problem. That you don't want to have the solution, but you want to try to have a kind of a, a discovery moment when uh, at the moment of analysis and the discovery moment uh, Farah has to be articulated in relationship to the to the constraints that you are trying to map and and dis and disclose. And I think that something should happen at the analysis data retrieval level that would allow us to make the uh, a proposition. But I think right now the proposition I agree with Nelson. It's not. Uh, it's not at the level of the question. But I'm. I'm. I'm uh, I want to clarify something. I think the actual, the project's not even the solution here. I think the yeah. the, the just the the formulation of the question in terms of like explaining what's going on, and the because like you might have an intuition about something. I mean, you lived in New York, so you know that that's a fact. But once you have the data to back it up. It's a different story. Just right. the mapping, the survey is actually the project. So for me, like, I mean, I'm I'm willingly like want, I willingly want to kind of like forget about the solution. Like I'm 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 uh, I'm enamored uh, by the question. But that's that's the point of the studio, by the way. If there is no discovery in the in the survey, right? That that means that you're not really paying attention to the you're not following the methodology in a way. But I think Farah, it, 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 uh, Farah made to me one of the best drawings that I saw in terms of form follows uh, finance. The book form follows finance could have Farah's drawings, by the way, right? And that to me is an achievement. It's a very interesting problem, right? Between exactly for me, that's the project. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah. Any any comments, Sandra, uh, Gustavo? Gustavo, uh, you have been writing. Uh, uh, no, no, I I made difficult comments. to follow your writing. No, no, I, I want to hear I want to hear what Sandra has to say because I think there's a lot of potential with the data for sure. Uh, well, I had just a, a very very simple question. Uh, there is a drawing on on top of uh, your Miro board. If I zoom out, it's. Where did it go? Is it way up? The, which one do you, you, because these are all. What was less. a drawing of a, a floor plan? I think probably of the two levels. I don't know. Sorry, I cannot find it anymore. Probably maybe, maybe that's what we need. We need that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Because you have the subway floor plan on the left, Farah. On the mm -hmm. uh, on the left, you have the subway uh, flat. Uh, but now we need the uh, the other floor plans also, right? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, entering a new project already. So sorry. 
Uh, in the middle more that they might be mixed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So, yeah. I refer probably to another project at first. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem of pinning up uh, <laughs> the way you guys do. <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> uh, Sandra, do you want me to step in real quick? And uh, I'll just step in real quick. Um, I wanted to say thank you, Farah, for what you're. I think the observations are are very provocative, for sure. And I was thinking about uh, Don Norman. I mean, he wrote a book, and I put it on the chat. The idea of you know how design follows, you know, human movement and activity. But I think what your project is theorizing is that what if we did know the links between the kind of the capitalist underbelly of why cities are created, but revealing the data of how they really work. Because I think that, uh, and maybe I'm cynical here, but I've been lied to so much by politicians and business folks and clients and whatever that I'm starting to really be very clear that when you have facts behind your side, then you can make the larger um, risk in design or an in investment in asking a deeper question. Um, so I think what you, you're doing is revealing a lot of problems, social problems that are realized in material. But then I go, wow, what is the motivation now? What is she going to find? So you're kind of like a, a cave explorer. Have you seen those movies where you go into a cave? into the ground and then you see all these beautiful landscapes so i'm thinking what big crystals is she going to find what are these big forms what animals what so i'm thinking about it at that level but thinking about it as data like how many people move within the systems of the subway how much water is moving how much data is moving how much money is moving i mean where is i mean i'm assuming there's fewer people that live around central park uh, because of the rent uh, versus some some other place that you live. So I think that there's social commentary here. There's data. I mean, I think analysis and study, but I think you can find novelty in form too. So there's data visualizations, scientific visualizations that can possibly help you frame these real spaces. And I, I was thinking, what about a data cloud? You can actually make this data cloud virtual thing that lives over New York that really personifies a lot of this data. And then you can make this, uh, this organism, this data organism that lives underneath the city and starts eating all of this data and they come together somehow. I mean, there's so much potential and uh, I just wanted to thank you for the work and the, and the provocation for sure. Yeah. Um... I, I agree, Gustavo, with the, with the data. The, I, Farah was also working on simulations of pedestrian movement. Uh, you didn't show the video, I think, uh, Farah, right? But uh, the pedestrian movement, right, discloses, um, you know, the, the, the kind of foreign relationship between commuting and just going to work versus the people that actually are leaving the city, uh, right? There is like the suburban kind of middle class that uh, do not relate to the city, they just go to meet and work and they take the elevator and they don't see the city at all. Then you have the, the as an extreme condition is the homeless, right? Like being, uh, actually we, we saw in a lecture last week, uh, uh, how Hannah Leo disclosed the fact that homeless is a, pro, is a production part of the equation of the growth of New York City. It's not that homeless is like, ah, oh, poor people, they lost their home that are actually being forced out of their homes by the system of production of real estate. So uh, to me, the, to identify the movement and the mobility of the people and the experience that those different people have gives you different uh, means of measuring uh, the landscape and the territories of how different people actually understand the city. And then you have the 1% that comes from the sky in the helicopter, right? They don't. They never touch the ground, right? Uh, it's uh, directly uh, from the Hamptons to the tower, right, in a helicopter, uh, or from another city, from London, usually, right? Jet, uh, a helicopter, up, right? It's a total different perception of the city. 
Well, well, one thing, Farah, I was dreaming is that, you know, with this budget stuff that we talk about, the trillions of dollars, if your visualization can reveal where that money is going, because literally, if you think about all that pollution from all those people that are really not taking advantage of public transportation, don't even pay the taxes to make it. Yeah. I think architects have the power to change this planet politically as well as theoretically and spatially. And I think you're you're talking about the political and then the communication aspect is very powerful. So I would say focus on that somehow and follow your instincts because I think they're they're really revealing something to your experience for sure. I have one more comment maybe on the the, the dreams or potential um, uh, relationships that you might be able to establish uh, about the experience through a kind of virtuality, like the, the video game uh, interface and its potential. Uh, all of this impoverishment that us mere poor mortals, either if we uh, have access to some vertical buildings, but not others, or if even worse, we're homeless and we have no access to this, there's a potential for creating the kind of experience that really only in the, the, the imaginary world of, you know, Superman and uh, Spider-Man in, uh, in the kind of mythology of, of uh, New York City and it's the potential of experiencing this non-human way. I think there is a potential to create a sort of inversion of this uh, subway world where the masses occupy the subway and very few discrete people go up into these vertical structures. And there's a potential of inverting that relationship within the, the, the virtual world of your, of your project. And although that doesn't solve the problem of capitalism within New York City and access to these wonderful views uh, and, and spaces, but it potentially creates a prototype which connects uh, discrete archipelagos of, of these towers um, in ways that um, I think has some already indication of the shift of the discrete tower to the interconnected tower. If you look at, I would, I would have a look at all, all of the projects for the World Trade Center competition. Although this is 20 years old already, and it seems like it's nothing new, not that many of these kinds of interconnected towers have been built. Uh, and it's a potential for innovation, which uh, we haven't seen that many examples. So despite the competition being not so new, there's really a potential to learn from the relationship of mobility at a kind of very high level. Uh, and also uh, about the, the ways that we can occupy a, in public space, uh, the verticality of, these, um, of the city. Uh, and that potentially might offer some clues about how to reimagine the public access for um, uh, towers of high level. By, by the way, thank you, Tom, for mentioning World Trade Center, because I thought that actually the competition, I, I was part of one of the teams, uh, 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 the Eisenman team, which was the ugliest one, but the most interesting one, I think. <laughs> and exactly that was the conversation to make the horizontal towers. That's why we proposed uh, vertical. I wanted to have only elevators and horizontal towers, but then uh, Richard Meyer, uh, you know, wanted really to, have, and Peter also wanted to have the grid. But to me, the, the point was to reverse the relationship between vertical and horizontal. And that's why we did the uh, multiple, and actually from a financial point of view, uh, it worked because the, the problem of the suburbs is that they have the horizontal floor plate. And that's why many offices they work in, uh, in New Jersey. And, we, and one idea was to actually transfer the typological uh, relationship between the suburbs and the city uh, to create horizontal uh, vertical cities, literally. So that's, I, I think that that's an interesting problem because we actually literally were trying to address what Farah is saying uh, in a different way. From, actually from a business, you know, if you want from a real estate point of view, which is a problem, but we left the void of the towers empty, which many people tried to do also, which was uh, kind of a nice thing. But in relation, that, but Tom, the air, before you talk about World Trade Center, what you were saying is actually what I think Farah's project is. Yeah. So I totally agree, uh, and I, and you think it's possible. So that's why I was as I was supporting it. Uh, uh, so the reading that you're making is the one that I'm trying to also push forward. So thank you for the comment.
Well, yeah, thank you, Farah, for presenting your work. I think the sketch is just above the section that you showed a Skywalker. Uh, yes. Yeah, there's a plan. And I would, well, was just wondering, is this your work? Uh, yes. So how do you, did you retrieve, uh, I'm, I'm just looking specifically for this, uh, for this plan on the left. Uh, that, uh, about uh, the axonometry. On top of the axonometry, on top of the axonometry, this image uh, here, yeah, exactly. Yes. So how did you retrieve it? Uh, it's the subway platforms uh, shape, uh, there's open data on subway platform shape file. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, from a data set, so it's not your work, it's something that you retrieved from the internet, right? Because actually this looks really just uh, like something that through machine learning, uh, uh, first or second generation uh, plan uh, mapping system would probably generate. So it was very <laughs> familiar aside from me, but, but uh, I really love the, the, the touch that you, it's precise, it's unprecise as, as, as Reglin would call it, you know, it's not, it's data, of course, it's very... Uh... That's she the less, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I like how people claim, you know, that, uh, you know... But... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, but it's also very suggestive, you know, so, so it's, uh, it's a data set that offers something to you as an architect to read into, or as a, uh, where data really becomes inspirational. And for me, images, our data as well. So, so I, I see plans and sections also as, as, as this type of data that a uh, machine learning system will learn of. And of course, uh, if you would like, uh, I think it's really far for you have to make the decision whether you want to uh, uh, make a contribution through, uh, through the, um, on the social implications and uh, the economy of, of st and state of affairs, or if you would like to Arc, uh, a specific architectural problem that is connected with these social uh, discrepancies. So uh, whether or not you you might uh, even uh, so you might even need to go to something like process automation. That's how, uh, for example, uh, systems uh, pro uh, propose uh, or, or uh, artificial intelligence that is connected to economies use of often the uh, process automation algorithms. So uh, if you want to go that, or if you want to go to recommender systems, you know, to uh, propose different scenarios or what consumers and users would choose, you know, so that's, that's something you really have to think about. What do you, what you, you use, use your intuition first for uh, seeing this problem of the skyline. Is it really the skyline, the problem? So is this really, uh, just the manifestation or the palimpsest of, of, of the problem. So do you tackle the problem through, through its palimpsest or do you want to tackle the problem through its inner workings? So uh, I think that's something that you have to consider first before you can propose any sort of solution. But I was intrigued by this image and of course by the videos that you generated uh, uh, at the end of your presentation. They are also very beautiful, very imaginative, and very proposalistic, you know, so to be, to invent a new word. <laughs> yeah, Sandra, thank you for the comments. Yeah, I agree. So uh, I think that in a way, the, the, what you're saying is that the, the problem can be disclosed in multiple ways, and that will help actually to uh, propose an investigation. And, and the technology through which you look at the problem should also be part of the of the issue in itself so i think we're going to continue working uh, at different levels addressing them through different types of technology so that we actually develop uh, one that matters um thank you tom for for joining us i see that you, you have to leave uh, but uh yeah great to see you sandra gustavo nelson uh good luck to all the students thank you <laughs> thank uh, you see, tom we see, we see you thank in the you, final tom. thank, thank you, you. Um, oh, uh, I just wanted to chime in for one second. I think, uh, Farah, I mean, um, I can't really say uh, when I try to do projects like this, I was not rewarded at UCLA. So basically, I had 
different professors saying, you know what, you have so much imagination, uh, but you know, what are the spatial implications? So here, it's kind of this, your professor's giving you freedom. And I think within that freedom, there's so many traps. So I would probably go back uh, and speak uh, with Pablo and try to find out what is really good commentary, I think, and what is the question I think that will like strike the spear in the eye of the monster, if the monster is capitalism or if the monster is inequality, because I think that is the juicy part of, I think, what's happening here. It's so juicy that I'm, I'm going, okay, uh, for the last, you know, several weeks, I've been thinking about not Deleuze, but I, then I've been going back to Bataille, Benjamin, Jameson, Foucault, and then I'm going, okay, what is she trying to say and reveal in her process? And I think following your instincts is very important. And I like what Sandra said before, I think her comment, I mean, um, I'm not trying to get overly excited. I'm just saying that great work, there's a lot to do and don't make the problem so big that you get lost. So that's kind of how I would say that. Uh, but Gustavo, you also, I thought that you were going to talk about the Benjamin Branton, Branton's uh, stack. By the way, uh, we did a diagram much earlier than Benjamin yeah. Branton, exactly this, this, this uh, oh. uh, addressing that. And we published it actually in our book, Architecture Information, much earlier. Good, good, uh, good. Which is Where's a, the credit? A, well, which is, a, <laughs> but, but he identified what, yeah. what I've been working for many years, which is the mm -hmm. fact that you have different plateaus of information, right? right? And that you can actually navigate through them. And that's actually the strategy that I do in all my studios. Uh, and that's why I use um, a kind of like a, a stacking of different platforms, and then you have to navigate through them. But but your comment is, uh, is more precise in relationship to FARA, because literally you can do that in terms of the vertical and horizontal that you could actually think about the infrastructure of society, uh, uh, literally in terms of uh, uh, Rivera's frescoes in the Rockefeller Center, right? I'm, I'm talking about that level, right? Like what's the relationship between inequality and different platforms of uh, computational platforms, right? Relative to the verticality of the city. Uh, so we have the uh, workers developing the towers, but now we have a, a parallel virtual kind of uh, a society, right? In terms of uh, Google, Facebook, and so on, holding the world up, right? And, and creating pollution, right? Like that's what you were referring to before. And then we have the people navigating through them and not really having any choice. So I think that is, a, is an interesting uh, problem to pair the physical construction of the city to the uh, what's happening now with uh, platforms. Uh, at, at least that's my interest relative to deconstructing the, the politics and the economics of uh, computation relative to that. Well, Pablo, one thing that I really enjoy is with this dialogue is that, you know, I like, um, I didn't really appreciate this early, but now I appreciate it a lot, is that when you have a mastery of history or you understand how things are innovative, both technologically and conceptually, especially in architecture, then you can have an informed, okay, now we found the top of the mountain or we found the top of this peak of knowledge. I'm going to make this little spark. So my question, Farah, to you is, if you know uh, Pablo has made this type of leap conceptually by observation and Benjamin has made a conceptual leap and he's been speaking about it now and now he heads a school, what are you in this studio trying to say or comment or uh, evolve out of that? Is there another space that you're finding? Is it by the algorithm or the mechanics of the machine learning that you can find another operation or mathematical understanding of how we perceive space virtually? And then I think that comes back to the physical philosophically and metaphorically. So, I mean, Anyway, great. I didn't know that, Pablo, but I think that I would love to read more about that and understand how that evolution of how we frame reality through communication technologies might be another way of thinking about this project. Yeah, no, great. Thank you.
All right, so we have one more project. I don't know if uh, Sandra, Gustavo and Nelson, if you can uh, stay longer. Sandra, you're muted, yeah. I, I, I try, so I will be here. <laughs> All right, we have a uh, caveat. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Farah. Uh, thank you. Kavia, uh, thank you, by the way, so much for your generosity to the jurors uh, for staying so long and uh, for your comments. I think that this is actually a great, really high level discussion. No, no, so. What? What, Nelson? You're talking in French to somebody else there. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kavia, you want to go ahead and present? Yes, I'll do that. Good afternoon, professors, and also to my fellow mates. I. Okay, so the, uh, I, I'll discuss my basic objectives and then I would go through my project. Um, the, the site which I've selected is the Rockefeller Center along with the St. Cathedral Church. And the basic objectives are two. One is uh, to create and vir vir basically a virtual reality game uh, connecting the Rockefeller Center to the di directly to the church that is via ramps and through concourse levels. And the other one is uh, to track the pedestrians and uh, to I, I basically I uh, when I had gone to the Rockefeller Center for the case study, I uh, it started raining all of a sudden and I couldn't find a spot to uh, basically uh, take a shade. So what I thought is why not create an app wherein you track the pedestrian uh, traffic and link it with the weather forecast and see. Uh, see the app. I mean, you can basically see the app and uh, find a shade for yourself or a sitting region or if if it's uh, good to visit the skating ring. I mean, basically an app to decide all these things. That that would be the reality based and this the uh, ramps connecting the Rockefeller to the church is the virtual reality. Um, so Rockefeller Center is basically a city within a city because it con connects the verticality to the horizontal horizontality. Based in my in my scenario, I'm just taking the pedestrian paths as the horizontal paths, and for that I had documented. I, I had gone. Uh, I had done the uh, uh, photogrammetry scanning basically. And I couldn't exactly get it. So I used the Google API and I created, this is the one which I used the Google API and I created the images. Uh, you could see that it, these scans were not that good. So I had to go through it. And that's how it came out to be. And to do that, I also uh, activated the CA, that is a cellular automation uh, to the Rockefeller centers. I am considering in the Rockefeller centers, I'm just considering the entrance lobby and the foyer and the concourse level that is the below ground level, including the skating ring. So I, I tried to apply the game of life in a 2D format. I created it, uh, you, it with reference to what uh, Professor Pablo shared. And this is what I could create in a 2D format. And then I eventually build it up. I wouldn't say it's a 3D, but it's like a half 2D. Uh, this this is the this this is just the uh, I, I generated it till 30, 30 generations. This is the fifth generation, followed by the the 30 generations. So this was at the fifth, and then this became at the 30. I didn't run it forward. And for the entrance for uh, for the entrance lobbies, which uh, I thought of connecting to the uh, cathedral church, 
I did a, a minimum relaxation. I mean, for the entries. So you have these pockets for from where the ramps would be connected. And it would look like somewhat like this. Th this this is where the skating ring is situated. This these are the uh, shopping centers for the Rockefeller. Again, this and this is the main. So undergrounds, it would be connected like within, and the black ones are the original pedestrian parts. And uh, for I mean for for the app, uh, I I I. I went through a few tutorials and that was the object tracking. Basically, you, uh, I couldn't exactly track the human. I have to track a human being, but I could track like the, basically anything in motion. That's, that's the agenda here. That's what I created and I have to still work on it. I can show you. But you want to retrieve the, the people and how they use the space, right? Yes, I want to, the same thing will be applied, but I, I I need help with that. So yeah, we'll work on it. So this is how it, it's not a proper one, but that's how it would look. Yeah, we're actually going to start working with seg semantic segmentation uh, in relationship to the point clouds. So that's what you need. So can, can you so leave that the is, code up, please? uh should i go to the no no oh, it's okay i'll go back later All right continue okay so that that's how it is yeah. all right so you are in exploring uh different things in relationship to the rockefeller center so just to to clarify to the reviewers because they might be a little confused but um so you're trying to create what, what's the idea so you're you're mapping these things right to, to be able to redesign the ground level at the Rockefeller Center, right? Yeah, at the concourse level. Okay. All right, thank you, Kavya. Thank you. Well, I mean, I can start. I mean, thank you very much for um, for your work. And you're, you're putting together a lot of uh, complex um, ideas, especially at the end, looking at tracking people as agents within a certain type of environment um, and how that would influence the, the kind of the formulation at the end. I mean, my question, it seems like we've seen so many different projects. Uh, one had a politically sharp, uh, you know, statement. Another had, I think, a, a, a social statement about a political infrastructure and access to information. Um, but now I think here, you're, what you're looking at is basically the study of an urban environment and how that can impact the geometrical transformations within a space. Is that the, the, the question you're framing or what is the, the ultimate core question that you're asking in your project? Uh, yeah, basically I wanna um, you, uh, track the pedestrian uh, paths, how they go about uh, to to basically design an underground concourse level. Okay, okay. So you're looking at data from the above ground to look at how it influences data below ground. Is that what you're saying? Well, actually, it's at the both levels. Okay, perfect, perfect. So now that I get that, I think that is. Um, so maybe it's more in line with the second project. Like if you and Farah could, you know combine a, a super project and you could see how data form can manipulate to real, you know, an analytical uh, data coming from the street. Uh, what I'm, I think, coming down to is now that you have these two datas, what is the, what is your theory or hypothesis behind that? Do you have a question that you want to answer when you look at this data? Or is it just you want to see what forms are produced? Uh, I want, uh, can you repeat that? I didn't exactly follow through. Well, okay, okay. Well, mostly as a, 
I remember a lecture about uh, a scientist that made these agent model schemes for, for catastrophe. So he was paid by the federal government to make agent-based models of how people evacuate stadiums, right? <clears throat> so depending on the threat, different people would evacuate in, in different uh, densities. So I'm, and that could be, that could inform an architecture or that could inform a certain type of uh, distribution of exits, right? Planning. So with all of these data flows, what are, you, what are you looking for? Like, what is your intuition telling you as a human being now with however many years you have lived on the planet, what, what are you seeing? What do you want to find in this data? Uh, have... Okay, with this data, I want to uh, like, design the in okay instead of using the uh, roads which has traffic and uh, uh cars and everything i just wanted for the pedestrian like it's a complete pedestrian path but localized like within the sub sub ground and also maybe elevated directly to the areas where you want to visit so basically in rockefeller center you have the shopping shoppings uh, and then you have the church so i just want to link direct ramps or, or and any of such things so that's that's the physical but what about the virtual how does it work in the virtual or are those two the same for this you? this is what i will i would do this I, I, I would convert it into the virtual what, what is what i was thinking because in reality this is not possible well well i guess just to press a little further i think that's where the well pablo and this studio gives you the freedom to really think about, you know, instead of being the architect and client, you know, paradigm model, you know, the data is dictating a certain type of uh, form or the, the question and the data or are presupposing a certain type of thing. So maybe I'm unclear about how you're going to carry it out in the virtual if, or if they should be separated, but I just wanted to thank you very much for the work that you've done and what you're trying to do. So I'll leave it to another panelist to continue. Thank you. Yeah, to me, I agree with how it would be better to, because Kavya, you know, you're a surprising person because uh, I think that in general, you don't have too much work for, for the studio and in the program but you have a talent that you're not exploring. Uh, and I have, to, I have to be very open and honest. I think that you have a talent for coding. It's, a, it's amazing. Uh, you, you can be a very high level coder because you understand the abstraction of mathematics and computation, but somehow we are not able to make you work at the level of your capacity. Uh, and I don't know if maybe uh, you're adapting to the US because you're just entering, you're coming from abroad. Uh, to me, to be honest, when I studied in Princeton, my first semester, I totally screwed it up. I, I was not able to do anything. Uh, I was uh, with Jesse Reiser, uh, Stan Allen, right? They were a lot of uh, very good, I had a lot of very good professors. My computer arrived late. Uh, I did not understand anything. I did not understand, I, I did not like the food. I, I, it was a, a catastrophe for me. Uh, I didn't have money, I mean, not to mention that, but um, somehow, we need to make you be at the level that you could be. And I feel like we are not uh, yet able to, because you have very interesting moments. Uh, now you're working with the AI systems. You were, you were coding very well, but somehow the relationship between the coding and the architecture, it doesn't really work. Uh, like the surfaces that you're developing, you code them well, but the surfaces themselves are not that architectural. Uh, and, and I think that there is this, this mismatch between information, computation, and, and, and the actual narrative of the project that we need to work out better. And I think it's a matter of time only, to be honest, because um, I, I am confident, by the way, uh, we were chatting with Nelson, uh, the four projects, are, the four of you are very good, talented, intelligent students. Usually it's not like that. Uh, in a class, you have like one person that, works very well and then the rest are not that great. Everybody here has a very interesting position. Uh, you have talent uh, and I think that you could do great, but somehow in this particular case, uh, the relationship between the site 
And the, what you do in the site is, is there, but not completely there. So I think that you need to articulate uh, a little bit more the relationship between the computational system that you're using and why you're using them in relationship to the site. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I, I am actually happy to see that you were able to activate the techniques. Now we need to relate the techniques to the content more. Uh, just one question. What is your background, Kavya? Are you it's coming at it as an architect or? I, uh, as an architect. Okay, got I didn't... it. Are you, how many generations? I'm third generation in this line. Uh, here. You're lucky. Uh, you're the lucky. Uh, so, I mean, I, I get into trouble because I don't like authority. So I just tell everyone nicely to look away because I get to do whatever I want. Um, but I think when I look at your project, how about the idea of play? If you're an amazing coder, you could literally make programs to make other forms, programs to make programs. Uh, there was a great dissertation from one of my colleagues called Artificial Natures, and his name is Graham Wakefield, and he's a professor um, in Canada. But what he did was he, he, his whole arc of 15 years is called Artificial Natures, where he makes this system and it builds life systems within systems. They breed, and then within each breeding, it creates a program that lives and dies depending on the energy flows that the program gets, right? So I'm going, wow, what if she played a little bit with maybe adding another, uh, you know, inquiry, research inquiry, maybe these uh, flows and different uh, movements can be influenced by something within the environment that you're trying to track, maybe color, maybe uh, if you have, uh, you know, audio, you can, have uh, trackers of sound, loud sounds, like whatever. I'm just thinking maybe play might free you up in this production aspect. Because I think when I get um, when I get a little tight, I feel mm -hmm. constrained and I don't act in a creative, fun way. And I think pa you and Pablo would probably work well together if you played more. And I think he would say, yeah, keep playing or constrain it and you'd get to a faster result. That's all. But thank you again for your work. Can, can I enter that? Thank you. I, yes. I, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably come out of left field here, but I, I don't, I don't see that. Like, I don't think there's a problem. Um, I think she's just working the other way around. Yeah. Because she's going really fast on the technique, and for me, there's no right way to go. Like, you can yeah, go yeah, to, yeah. You know, from the general to to the to the specifics or or, or back the the important thing is that you follow certain steps that and, and that those steps are explainable to other people and that other people can understand them so they can collaborate and that's probably the part where where we're not getting because i'm i'm her professor too so uh, but uh yeah the narrative part but the, the the things that if you invert the order of things then the narrative comes last yeah, no problem for me yeah that's what I mean. So, that, like, I, I want you to put the code up uh, of the the app you built because I, I need to clarify something. Like for me, architecture and and software systems are not very different. Yeah, they like are, for me, they, she's already the doing architecture by yeah. doing this. Okay, so even though there's no grand narrative, there's no. Uh, I don't know, like Foucaultian uh, analysis of power structures and stuff like that, which I love um, and I respect deeply. I don't agree with everything he says, but um, that's a different story. I, I actually think that she's doing she's doing a project right now. That's that's what I meant in the other project with Farah. Like she's already doing the project. You know, it's, projects are no longer about like what result are we going to show the world or. You understand? Like it, it's actually about the process and the and, and of making of the world. You know, it's, it's what makes the world the world. Actually, and Nelson, I, no, I want. I was, no, yeah. Pablo, I just want to step in. Yeah. No, I, I get that, but remember, we're human beings and we live in the world and we communicate with language. And I've worked with software developers for so long; they're the most beautifully creative people, but half the time they don't communicate anything until you give them a True. deadline. True. And then they present everything and then it's magic. But if you work with them and you project manage a software engineer, 
they will produce for you because I've done it and I've seen it. But it's a matter of, do you want to cramp how they creatively code and see the world? So that's not what I or a collaborator wants to do. You want them to grow um, creatively. And I think for me, the comment to play was that if, if there's a production of code that's exponential in this student, then there should be a way to communicate that exponential production and how it's realized in form. Because I think that would help inspire other students. And um, and I totally I and I, I totally agree with that. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily disagree with that. Now, because for me, like even coding, everything, like if, if you're building something, it's art. You know, it's, it's in some way or form, you know. So it's, it's there's there's disciplinary differences, but the 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 relationship to the to the human spirit is very similar because we're all building the world. So, and, and the world has a lot of things in it. Uh, what, what I mean by, because I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a software development degree right now. And I see all you said is probably true. Like the best coders are the way you describe them and, and all that. But there's a, a consciousness about what you're doing that if they haven't been, I don't, don't want to say school, but if they haven't read architecture books, like. Christopher Alexander's book or something like that, they might not be aware of that of the influence that architecture has had in their disciplines and the other way around, and that we're experiencing a boomerang effect right now. So and, and it's in that context that I say that Kavya is already doing architecture. For me, this is insanely interesting. Actually, I, I agree with both, if I have to say, because I think Gustavo is actually saying about uh, what I'm interested in, the, the confluence between culture and technology mm -hmm. uh, as non-separated elements. And, and actually, Nelson, the objective is, and we go, you know, we mentioned Borges, but the objective is not to use Borges as a metaphor. The objective mm -hmm. is to understand mathematically exactly. concepts of infinite in the coding, right? So I agree with you. And, and I agree that Kavya is already doing an architecture of information already, which is the you know, my objective is the architecture of information, but uh, Kavya doesn't know how to use it in a way, right? It's like uh, the architecture is there, but we don't know why, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the only comment would be that there has to be, yes. for this course at least, there has to be a cultural inquiry and there has to be some cultural framing. Well, that. but like the that. culture, the That's cultural right. framing, hopefully, would come from within the technical exploration, like me. That's what to I me, think. Yeah. To me, it's like uh, you cannot speak uh, without language, right? That's why linguistics. I'm glad Gustavo, you're mentioning linguistics because mm -hmm. all my theory of computation is based on mm -hmm. digital signifiers, which is uh, mm -hmm. you learn how to speak by coding, and then you can express yourself within the ranges of possibilities of the coding. And that's what Nelson, you're saying that the architecture and the message is in the coding. Uh, then it's, it's media the language too. exactly, and it's media specific, right? If it is not media specific, there's no uh, poetry, let's say, right? Uh, because if you deal with translation, if you translate uh, uh, the architecture of the coding and then you translate it into architecture, then it would be a translation, and then there would be no poetry at the coding level. Uh, or mm -hmm. there would be no, uh, yes, exactly. No. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with the, with both of you, actually. So I'm, well, I'm yeah, glad. I didn't, I didn't necessarily disagree with Gustavo, actually. I, I just <laughs> wanted to highlight an aspect of it that I think, you know, I, like, but for me, I'm there's happy no that we're having this discussion because we're getting into a, an important uh, element. Pablo, one thing uh, I included, uh, so my degree is coming from the Media Arts and Technology program yes. at UCSB. And I've lived over a decade with people that make their own computational languages. Exactly. And they actually make their own systems of, of coding. So literally I've been in rooms where you talk for six to eight hours on the philosophical implications exactly. of different paradigms of creating geometry or data flows or well, how things are substituted. So, I mean, I would say that again, you have, um, if you have this proclivity, there is so much power in following that to a certain conclusion. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to communicating with people, 
that's another story. And mm -hmm. I think that, I think Pablo, maybe this studio could be the precursor to a book. You know, how, well, what are uh, the problematizings of all this? But what, you're calling, but what no. you're calling different languages and different forms of expression, I call it authorship. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, that if you are not, if you don't do that, if you don't author the language, right? You're not really uh, doing an architecture of information. You don't, uh, you're, that's what Nelson is saying, that if there's mm -hmm. no architecture at the coding level, right? There's no architecture at all. Of because, course. And, th and that's the problem that we have with architecture today, uh, that the, the architects want to still design buildings faster, um, you know, like using the technology to build better, but they don't understand the radical philosophical transformation of that's contemporary that's thinking. Why all buildings look the same, look the same, even then when yeah. they're not. But Gustavo, I, in the architecture information book, that was the argument in 2013. Uh, but people hated me for that, and and also Mario Carpo did not agree because Mario Carpo uh, says that uh, we are in the in the area in the era of shared uh, authorship, and I, I agree with that. But that's not the problem. The problem is that we are not authoring the architecture of our systems and that, uh, that we're only using. And the artists that you're sharing, Gustavo, they understand that better than architects. Because, uh, and that's, that's what, to me, uh, what is the boundary here. And that's what our program, we're trying to do in this program. We're trying to arrive to author uh, our systems of communication so that we are activating the architecture at the linguistic level. Oh, I posted your, I'm, I'm going to take a look at your um, lecture briefly and be ready to come and talk here at, uh, <laughs> for our program, because I, I, I see that there's going to be very, that's a lot a, of but synergy. That's, that's what, that's what the sense yeah. that I had about you, that you are yeah, talk, yeah. you're understanding things different than other architects. That's oh, why yeah. I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted you to, to come. I wanted you to come to our reviews because I, I can tell that. Well, 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 part of the reason why I left architecture was I was in a firm and I realized that the coder could replace 50 people. Exactly. And then, right. but is the coder, um, does he have enough experience, wisdom? Does he know enough about knowledge? I think we're at that, we've evolved now to a different stage where if the coder were the architect and they were the humanist and the theorist, I think they would reveal more problems that we as a society don't want to tackle. I mean, truthfully, architects um, are masterful at summarizing spatial problems and scientists don't really give credit because they think they master knowledge in their domain. And I think uh, politicians and, and or policymakers, they think they master people and control of movement. But I think architects, if we were um, distributed throughout the professions, we need that type of dialogue to, to bridge humanity with the structural and with the digital, like money. Exactly. I totally agree. That's the problem of today. That's the crisis of today, actually. Uh, I am glad that we agree. There are, actually, we're not that many that we agree like this. So we need to, we need to make sure that we have more discussions because uh, when I presented this at Acadia, in Acadia 2010, in the, uh, you know, I chaired the largest conference in the world about, about computation. I said this and people hated me for that. And, and the only ones that agreed with that were the software uh, programmers. The okay. software programmers, the, uh, you know, uh, Yesios was there from Z. Uh, he said, you're absolutely right. And that's what we're trying to do. And then the architect said, oh, you're not, a, you know, it's better to design. You're against design. No, I'm not against design. I'm actually, I want to do design at the coding level, which is what you're not doing. And uh, people from Pratt and Columbia, they, they actually hated the conference because they did not understand that we were actually thinking in the next 10 years. And that's exactly what is happening now, that there is a dissociation crisis, even in the sciences, by the way. That's why we have uh, uh, racist algorithms, right? Because, and that's why the bias in artificial intelligence are not uh, capturing cultural problems because they are actually based on scientific data-driven conditions that are not addressing cultural values and cultural well, problems. Well, yeah. the way that I see this, Pablo, is that you were probably in the future way before the profession and the profession is still behind. So I think they're decades behind, even though we have the tools of machine learning and but to have 
wisdom to go with this knowledge takes decades to evolve. And so, you know, all you, you know, you guys are very lucky to have a professor that is hated because that hate will turn into a movement. Uh, but you need to believe in not being popular in the beginning and then running. Like basically you're gonna surf a tidal wave. So I think Pablo, you would definitely fit in a computer science program and a media arts program. Uh, yeah, artists, artists somehow are more radical uh, in a way. They're more, uh, they're more aware program, of the political, yeah. <laughs> of they're course. more aware of the political structures. And architects, they are complicit with the political structures. That's their, their, their problem, right? Well, I, I think in, I think artists uh, don't expect to make a living off of the, a certain <laughs> class. <laughs> but if if my if my employer is the person that uh, makes my livelihood possible. I want to please the employer. And there is a bias. Uh, I'm watching this uh, show called um, Dope Sick. I keep, I keep referring to it. It's literally about how big pharma changed the entire landscape of yeah. society. But as architects think about this, you know, your buildings, your people that you protect and don't want and have, want to have a nice full life were destroyed by um, random policies from the inside. So the decay happened from the inside. And we as architects, I think, have a, a responsibility to our society in the field to comment, to, to not say a client and wealthy, you're always right. And just give me a few billion and I'll be rich. No, you should say you're doing it wrong. And so, you know, at UCSB, we do you guys know the Munger uh, controversy? Um, you know, um, Charles Munger is a billionaire who decided to give hundreds of millions of dollars to the campus to build a jail cell yeah. for students. Unbelievable. And, uh, and he basically fancies himself as an architect. Yeah. So he should sue him, actually, all of we, us. No, no. And I, I said to Neil, I said to Neil, uh, why, why isn't the architectural community at arms? Like, why doesn't the AIA? Well, or exactly. well the AIA, something? right? The yeah. AIA. They and should then, be standing against that, right? That's right. But you see students that have little to no money that we entrust their lives and their happiness and freedom to live in a jail cell for four years. That is cool. But, but also, but even from an, a fire egress point of view, everybody dies. Like there's right. a little fire there, everybody dies. Everybody's you, dead. You have a pandemic and you die. Like <laughs> I don't, I don't get the entire. But anyway, I think this is where Pablo has innovation here. So follow his instincts and yours, and you'll get a really good result. So yeah. thank you very much, Pablo. Okay, thank you, Gustavo, for the comment. Thank you, Nelson. Nelson has to go, so we we can resume okay. here. We can finish here the review. Uh, congratulations. I thought it was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. It's one of those reviews that uh, that you get surprised because the, the, the level of talking and discussion was very high. So I appreciate. Uh, thank you, Sandra, Gustavo and Nelson for staying long uh, with us. And thank you for the students for engaging with what the problems that we are uh, presenting to you. Thank you. <laughs> so you just, to, just hold gracias, it there. Gracias, Gustavo. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Say hi to Matias for me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh, so bye. Uh, we stay a little bit with my students. Yes. I, I'm, I'm sure Justin just have to move this out and I can leave. Bye, everyone. Bye, Sandra. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Bye.